Hello and welcome to the Rock and Roll to Success. Today I have the honor of bringing my friend Alexander Parkridge, aka the Gentleman's Guild. Alex is a mentalist who helps companies and entrepreneurs increase their revenue and their work workforce performance through neuroplasticity, sociology, psychology, neuroscience, and philosophy. So we will try to delve in to all of these topics. Alex, thank you for coming, man. Welcome to the show. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me on, Gabriel. And uh, it's first appearance I've made on a podcast like this in a while, so I'm looking forward to it. Well, I'm honored to be your first in a while. And while we're speaking of firsts and beginnings, how did you get into these topics? What made you spark the interest in psychology, in neurology, in all of those things that you're so passionate about? So it began when I was actually very young, around I'd say the ages of eight to 10 years old. I always had this curiosity as every kid does, but I was curious specifically into why people are the way they are, why they do the way, what they do, especially with a uh, history of different mental health issues throughout my whole family. I sort of grew up seeing different aspects of that. And it was sort of, I kind of thought to myself, there has to be more than this. What is going on here? So that began my curiosity into the whole overall subject of humans. But then I found a direction for that in school, where I began with psychology and sociology. Uh, those were my first two introducing topics to this world. And then after school, I, I never really did very well in school. Uh, in all honesty, it was just out of interest, even though I didn't necessarily get the marks. I just liked doing it anyway, right? Um, but then I kind of came out of school and decided, you know what? I feel like there's still something missing. And I started exploring different topics such as early philosophy, even theology as well, uh, study of religions. And I thought, okay, well, each of these seems to answer a piece of the puzzle that the other one wouldn't. And I'd started to look at, you know, as I'd gone through college years, I'd gone through my own experiences, uh, negative and positive. I've come from addiction as well, specifically alcohol and um, smoking. And I tried other things as well outside of that, part of a party lifestyle. And these things that I'd been interested in, I started to see them manifest in my own life, having experienced them in both positive and negative ways. And that was, that was really where I thought, okay, so it's not just, I'm not just an alien here and observing everyone else. I'm going through this stuff too. This is something that we all seem to experience, whether that be poor mental health or um, you know, struggles and challenges. And there seemed to be a correlation, a similarity between all people. You see, I was raised to think that everybody is unique, and in their own ways they are, maybe by interests, maybe by even, you know, physiology. But I also started to realize, well, in a way of thinking, in a way of belief and emotions, if we were all so different, then why does things like religion exist? Why does politics exist? Why do big movements and collectives of people uh, exist where they have shared values, shared beliefs, backed by the similar emotional drivers that make them want to subscribe to those beliefs? And that sort of personal exploration through a turbulent time in my life led me up to around the age of 18, where after about four years of addiction, I decided to at that point, my mind can, or body couldn't take any more. And I had no choice but to go cold turkey, as the common t term goes. And that followed by one of the most profound and intense parts of my life in terms of really experiencing this, which is about six months of intense anxiety, panic attacks, all of that. Yeah, I couldn't even leave my house for a period of time. I was around the age of 19 when that finally subsided but then that led me to the point where I said okay well I've explored these things I've got a curiosity for them I've experienced them myself and to a certain extent being able to transcend them so what if I could do the same for others now I always had a bit of an altruistic streak but it was a thought of well if I can do it surely anybody can do it and that's what really birthed my professional work 
within these subjects as well. The curiosity began as a young child, just in that innocent curiosity every kid has. Then, having seen it in other people and experiencing it myself, gradually uncovering different aspects as to why this is. And that led me to the beginning of my career, which is where I thought, having looked at a lot of psychologists, neurologists, philosophers, they all believe that their way of thinking and their subject is the best. And I was continually shown that that's not true. There has to be a wheel. Psychology answers things that neuroscience won't, or that philosophy won't, and vice versa. And that's what made me realize that actually, I have to be polymathic in the way that I'm going to study and practice these subjects if I'm going to be the best at what I can possibly be. And that's what led me really to discovering this trifecta of, of subjects and actually practicing them. And so far, it has and continues to deliver amazing changes, not just in my life, but in other people's lives. And it seems to be the full picture. Yeah, you know, I really resonate with your story because also growing up, I, I like these kinds of subjects really soon because I also have a lot of problematic people nearby, so <laughs> I know what you feel. And yeah. I also had some bouts of um, problems, especially with alcohol when I was younger, so, so I also understand where you're coming from. <laughs> you said that you went full to cold turkey without the substances and that you had almost a year between uh, like six months to a year between being super anxious after you did this and actually being able to to get to get well again and to go through life well again so mm -hmm. I kind of lost my train of thought I'm <laughs> sorry no, of course. Uh, so if, if you have to go through it all again like how, with all the knowledge you have today, what would you do differently so that you could go through it faster? Go through it faster? That's actually a question I've never been asked before. Interesting. I would suggest realizing, believing that I could be more, basically. You know, that was my biggest issue. I'd gone through whatever I'd gone through at the time, as everybody goes through things that led to poor mental health, but a lot of the reason why I really indulged in that is because I was lost, as it is often with a lot of people. And it's because I, for such a long time, refused to accept that I could be more than what I was. And that actually, I would say among two things, that and the need to let go of control, but I'll get to that in a minute, that was what was responsible for me overcoming this anxiety. As, as a result of the cold turkey and it was really interesting because at the time I it wasn't sort of a, a gradually it got better it was sort of a high intensity crippling anxiety and suddenly nothing and it was the most bizarre thing and I didn't quite believe it I'm thinking am I just faking it or am I not what's going on here but that is to say that the two things that really allowed me to transcend that was the first is believing that I could be more than what I was because I was almost burying this very low self-esteem, low self-value and worth in alcohol and drugs to make me feel good. I was often the party animal, the social one, wearing that mask when behind you feel empty kind of thing, you know, the classic archetype. Yeah. And all it took was a specific conversation and it was with my uncle, actually. It was, he came around one day, and this was when I was in the peak of, you know, right towards the end before I went cold turkey. I was in the peak of my addiction, and my uncle came to visit. Now, me and my mother's side um, of the family were very close. And he came around, and he said to me, you've got to stop doing what you're doing. You're breaking your mother's heart. And it was that moment, I was like, no, I'm a mother's boy. I love my mother to bits. And I just needed to hear that to say, you know what, it's not even just about me anymore. It's, it's about others as well, people around me. I, said, I kind of went that night and said, you know what, I've got to stop this. There has to be more of it. Right? There has to be more to life than this. So to simplify the first part of that answer is what would I do or tell myself to speed that up faster? It was simply to realize, first of all, that it's not just about me. I'm hurting other people around me. Because when you're in that state, 
it's a very eye focused state you're just focused on you and your pain and you block everything out and it's just not true there are other factors to play that's a big motivator for wanting to break out of it and the second thing which I alluded to earlier which is realizing actually I needed to let go of the need to control everything because that's all anxiety is it's a deep need for control obsessive wise especially over the uncontrollable things and that's why you get anxious because like a social anxiety that's why that's huge because people can't control what other people think of them or what they say to them and they know that inherently and that's what gives them the anxiety in the first place fear of failure you know nothing's certain in life and you inherently know that deep down and that's why people have lots of anxiety around that it's all towards control and it took me a while to really get to grips with that because the only thing I felt I could control for such a long time was addiction you know what I was consuming my choice mm. to escape it all and that's why I latched on to so much, much of that but then training myself to let go of that need was simply by trying new things it didn't even have to be anything that was going to progress me forward financially or professionally often a lot of it was creatively that's where I started first discovering flow state which is that need to let go and sort of trust the mind and trust that life and you know the universe will give what you need it always does and and that that's what helped me break through it was realizing that actually I don't need to control anything everything at least I just need to control me everything else will sort of fall into line yeah that's a very interesting answer and I think you touched in some of the most pervasive points in society today and why so many people feel lost and so many people end up reverting to escapism in all of its forms mm -hmm. and about well first you mentioned about not being only about yourself and how we are raised in a way especially in the more western world to be thinking a lot about individual individualism in a nutshell yeah. and and achieving and being successful but from an individual standpoint and not necessarily thinking about the people around us and may, many times even trying to be successful at the sake of other people as well and just thinking about yourself and being egotistical in a way mm -hmm. and also the second point that you touched about letting go of things and about not needing to feel in control and how when you were using the substances that was something that you had control you had control of what you were putting in your body and and also so many people feel anxious exactly because of that because they feel like they don't have control about anything and if you look at mainstream media you will be bombarded like we grew up just like oh the world's gonna end before 2050 or something like global warming and so many all of those news that they really don't help people to live their lives and we're just anxious about an outcome that we're not sure if it's going to happen or not anyway so why should we be anxious so i yeah. think it's very interesting all of those points that you touched and also how so many people today end up resorting to escapism because of those topics that you mentioned so in a way your story is the story of millions and millions of people nowadays and how do you think that we could help them so that we can have more stories like yours of people that went through those things but they could succeed like just blast through those things and be able to be happy again and to be fulfilled yeah i would nail it down to three things one is personal the other one's social the, the, the third one is systematic And I'll start with the personal first. We'll kind of uncover the bigger picture as we go along. The personal, I would say it comes down to, as you said, a lot of the issue is that we are overstimulated, essentially. And there's so much noise going on there that then goes into our head and we don't know how to deal with the noise. So the personal would be to start engaging in accepting that you can be more. You know, making a priority to fulfill human potential first and you know what? I'll, I'll even simplify it more it's to change the nature of identity 
but that's what all mental health issues generally speaking outside of you know biological aspects factored in come down to anxiety depression um, as well as you know, things like insomnia even that are a, often a, a side effect of extreme anxiety and depression anxiety especially and it comes down to how one views himself now this is where we'll go into the social aspect which is where we are socially raised in the world to create something called an inauthentic social identity so what that is is it's this autopilot that you live within now up until about the age of five we don't have an identity really we're, we're just taught to explore play create the pure potential uninterrupted potential that's what we are as kids up until the age of five and then we enter into early formative conditioning naturally through our senses and then through parenting and then cultural because the parents are taught culturally and socially what is normal and they pass it down onto us and that's why it gets passed down through generations so socially it's about being able to not just personally break out of the identity but socially reinforce that as well because this is something everybody has we're all conditioned with this inauthentic autopilot of self but then alongside that deep hidden within us this kind of quiet voice call it an instinct we have what I like to call the core identity this is our PQ our potential quota it's without all the conditioning all the noise that's that five-year-old self again that is still there that's got all that uninterrupted potential and essentially we've just been psychologically lobotomized <laughs> as we've grown into the world and you get to a certain point in I'd say maybe around the age of 30 when you've gone through school higher education which is where we'll get into the systematic side of things which is where you get to a certain point in your, in your early career and that creative genius and that high level of curiosity is just seeped out of most people it's been robbed from them and some of them maybe only retain 5% of that creative you know potential left and that's really where the creative aspect is important because that's where our potential is creativity is limitless as are human beings in their ability to grow mentally so that's those are the three aspects that we need to change and it's first it begins with the individual accepting they can be more than what they are you know that's as I did you know my story wasn't anything unique compared to anyone else's I would say I'd love to tell an awesome story where it's kind of a no one's ever heard that before but it is what it is and I've gone through it like any other person has and I had to realize that you have to accept that you can be more than what you are and that starts with the individual then it's about creating that on a mass basis through first it begins in the family you know it's got to be normal it's got to be normalized to advance you know as a person grow as a person not just have beliefs and live with them for the rest of your life and then after that it's got to be systematic which is what's going to allow everything to come into play you know education systems uh, in terms of social media even the corporate environment it was all born from the industrial revolution the European aristocracy created the education system to make worker bees you know process low creativity worker bees you know and that's simply not going to suffice anymore especially with advancements into technology but that's that's really my three areas it's going to be systematic through education and you know social as well as the personal, and it begins with the individual always. Yeah, that's very interesting to think about. In the future, now that you've mentioned the technology and with AI and everything, and even in your document about flow and the flow state, you mentioned this, you yeah. use this metaphor of the working bees as well, and how <laughs> in the near future, and especially in the long-term future, many of the people who were conditioned to be worker bees, they won't be able to be employed or they will be quote unquote useless because the world kind of doesn't need them anymore or the machines can do most of the the work that the worker bees are conditioned to doing. So how do you see this in the future? The development both of how the worker bees 
can can maybe go back to their core identity of the five-year-old self or not and how we could try to shape society because like you said we also have not only the personal the social and also the systematic more in the level of a nation state kind of thing so how do you see the future and of course in the most potentially beneficial way that we could try to shape it so i'm quite optimistic about the future with technology contrary to what a lot of people are which is a very fearful about it so the way i see it in the future is whether people want to excel and evolve now or not it doesn't matter because at some point they're going to have to whether they want to or not they're going to have that choice taken away from them so it's obviously the better idea to begin now now with new technology since you know i would say the last 50 years especially um, we've been creating technology to make our lives easier last hundred years i'd say especially after world war one really it began um, and it sort of accelerated after world war two all technology that we create is created for one sole purpose to make human lives easier we've got to think less do less so you know the car for example we long past the days where you know we're using horseback that takes 10 times the time to get to the place you want to be you know we've got cars for that now right uh, mobile phones where it's not like you've got these big clunky phones that you have on the wall at home and you can't take it out with you or even the typewriters or anything like that you know even before phones all it takes now is a text to send something and then done that's it from someone all the way across the world it's all designed to make our lives easier for consumerism now what happens is this is where we are now and I'll kind of paint where we've been where we are and where we're going um, where we've been is we had the growth curve and now we're going into another one with things like AI um, you know augmented reality VR and other technologies but the shift is going to be from making technology for the sake of consumerism to making it for the sake of advancement now yes we fall into this idea that because we make high tech and advanced technology that we're intelligent as human beings well it's only the small exception of people that are innovating this technology and it's the technology that's doing the work for us not us so it's an extension of our potential but it isn't our potential if, if, if anything the less we have to think the further we regress so where I see the future and why I'm optimistic about it especially with technology like AI is that we're faced with two choices one is that we sit by the sidelines until we have no other choice to do so uh, which is where a lot of people are going to come out of work mainly process driven roles non-creative roles which makes up the majority of them uh, majority of the workforce all over the world for that matter and that's where people are going to have a lot of struggle and this is where a lot of people's fear comes from the fear comes from not the technology but the uncertainty of their own potential themselves they don't believe that they can be more than what they are and that's what gives them fear if everybody knew that they were limitless and that they had every skill to be able to thrive in the future with technology and they haven't got to worry about it there would be no fear but it's the lack of awareness of self that's where the fear comes from and it's also not from even the technology but it's from our fellow man's ability to use that technology for bad things against us the people that's another source of where the fear comes from so that's that's scenario one we refuse to change and eventually we become obsolete the second and more hopeful and which is what I see us personally going towards is where we understand technology isn't there to do everything for us but it's as a tool to work as an equal visionary partner alongside it alongside AI right I, I like to use AI as well because that's going to kind of encompass everything else I would say as new tech now AI when we create it it will fill most process driven roles so what does that mean for us if most of the process driven way of thinking is now obsolete well it doesn't it means it's got, we're going to have to not just not even redefine what it means to be human we're gonna to have to remember what it always meant to be human in the first place which is to have this 
again, five-year-old self, this creative, curious, you know, genius that is constantly wanting to accelerate, innovate, push forward. And AI will present a, an amazing infrastructure for us to be able to do that, to leverage it. It's going to be a partnership. We're able to help AI advance, and AI can help us advance. And that's where I see the most benefit from the future coming, really. New technology, if we leverage it, will go from where we are now, which is a consumerist convenience function of creating technology, to a, an advancement and a tool, which is where we want to use that much more. And we'll have to. And that's where I see not just... If, if, if I were to say there's an industry of the future with technology, it would be mental acceleration. It would be human potential itself, advancing the human mind. To then also possibly create new industries that we haven't comprehended yet. You know, that, that, that's something beyond our current comprehension, but it doesn't have to be. That comes with advancement. I already have certain ideas around what that could possibly look like, but that's where I see it, really. It's, it's using us as a tool to advance us further, not to make our lives easier. We don't have to fear it. The only thing we have to fear is our own refusal to our accept our potential. That's it. And do you think that this acceleration of the human potential or this expansion of the human potential would be done in a hardware form as well? Or we would use the regular natural human hardware and hmm. just leverage out-of-body systems, out-of-body computers? and. At least I get the impression that the main driver would be to use these things in education because the kids that are born today and in the near future, they will be the ones that will actually get the AI train and, and run with it because the older people, of course, many of them won't be able to adapt. And either because they don't want to or because they think they can't, but the people that are born right now and they're the ones that will be born soon they will live in this world since they were little so for them it will be normal so how do you see this like the education system and how we could help the these future kids to leverage the best way possible technology so through education specifically uh, it's going to be something called well it's by encouraging and actually maintaining something called fluid intelligence. So fluid intelligence basically is our natural state of being. We're what, as human beings we're what's called polymaths, which means poly, multiple. We're able to master multiple subjects and disciplines and integrate them into one. I demonstrated this in my own work, which is why those sort of seven core subjects as you read out at the beginning those are that's that's what's called polymathic training that's what we call it in our association when we train people and that will have to become the standard in education and at some point whether education systems or institutions want to do that even they're going to have to make a change because eventually it's going to get to the point where civil unrest will be the main driver of it people will be struggling so many people coming out of work so many will be that unhappy that to keep control, which of course is always the idea of the world makers, as I like to call them, um, they're going to have to change that. And civil unrest will be the, the most likely driver of that. A lot of unhappy people. So in terms of education, it's reinstilling fluid intelligence through not just... It's got to change from here's the exam, here's a question, there's five ways to correct, to answer it, but if you don't use this word, you fail. That's where we are now. But where we're going to need to be is, okay, answer it in your own way to demonstrate your understanding. And it sounds like such a simple example, but the overarching principle is fluidity. It's encouraging the creative part of yourself. And you know what, I'll use a personal example from my school years. My history teacher, who's my favourite teacher, he was a guy called Mr. Key. Ironic, I know. Um, but <laughs> key to one's potential. But that is, <laughs> he had this thing called unhomework. So he'd still set his homework, like every other teacher, because he had to, part of the curriculum. But 
he wouldn't just give us a sheet of things that we've got to answer correctly or a checklist where we've got to repetition repetition he would give us the ability to demonstrate our understanding in whatever way we wanted and I'll, I'll, I'll never forget the one homework he set us it was the most memorable we were studying the Battle of the Somme in World War One, and he said to us that we've got two weeks to go home and create something that depicts the Battle of the Somme in whatever way we want now two weeks later we all come into class and you wouldn't believe what some of these kids are bringing in I personally brought in a letter that a great-grandfather of mine had received from King George at the time wow. as honor for fighting in the war um, authentic and everything right all kind of tattered and sort of old we had a kid come in who built a full table sized paper mache battlefield wow. of a specific battle within the Somme that was that went down in history had tanks and everything that he built out of little wood ch sort of chips and everything soldiers everything and we also had a kid that came in with a fully made um, tank that was you know the size of I'd probably say maybe a you know those models that you get as a kid with the big cars that you can build like the Lego ones and things I'd say about that size and we also had a kid that came in with his great grandfather's M1 Garand rifle um, that was used in the song now of course it had to be you know there was some due diligence had to go past it was an arm it mm -hmm. was all out of commission and everything but um, it was brought in and it was fully authentic and it was amazing just to see the variation of what these kids did when they're given the space to leverage that creative part of themselves you know leverage that potential be explorative so that's the example that will need to be set for the future especially with new technology we're going to have to encourage that in education systems reinstill that fluid intelligence allow kids to really excel in every aspect of learning not just IQ quota which is where it's you know I've never bought into the IQ thing because it's all process driven very non-creative based again created by the same people that created the education system right that's the standard that's got to be it's got to be fluid it's got to be open here's the task show me what you can do that's where it begins yeah that story is just fascinating to think about and why don't we have this in every class why don't we encourage kids to do this and also like you said um, about how we are supposed to be polymath so maybe we should be teaching subjects in a more multidisciplinary kind of way because everything is connected and especially nowadays many of the the famous guys on the internet, like Dan Cole, for example, that's one of the most famous. They talk about how the, yeah. in the future, in the near future, even in the present, we kind of need to be a jack of all trades to know a lot of subjects and to mix and match and connect the dots. And that's where the real money will be in the future as well, because we need to go back to that route and be the Renaissance man again, like Da Vinci, like all of the other polymaths in the past mm -hmm. and yeah it's interesting to think about how we are kind of in a way there is this trend of people that already know this but at the same time the mainstream most of the people don't have any idea they still think in a very rigid very industrial revolution set of rules like you said before and also, when you were talking about the test and you're having to use a specific word or a specific sentence to yeah. get the check mark. And I was thinking about standardized tests and getting into college or getting into better school or whatever and how we still use those tests that maybe 50 years ago they made sense, but nowadays we have the technology to do better I think than to be able to leverage better the potential of the people as you like to say yes yeah it's again is another reason why I'm so excited because I know that we have everything we need already 
it would be much scarier if we knew what the change would be in the future and we had no idea how to do it. But we've always had the idea of how to do it. We had it when we were kids. This is why, and you also asked kind of where I see uh, it being done. Is it going to be artificial almost, where like the Neuralink is put in your head and almost done for you, or will it be organic? I don't like the idea of the Neuralink. And it's not even for this whole idea of, you know, people saying, oh, yeah, they can control your minds and they can, um, you know, see your thoughts and everything and there's no privacy. Sure, that will be a factor. But it's because we don't need it. It's the easy route. And a lot of people overlook this. But with the Neuralink, the majority of the population are in very processed left brain thinking. Now, with the Neuralink, it's essentially going to be a... It's like taking DMT or mushrooms for the first time, the psychedelic, where suddenly you go from one end of the spectrum to the other, where, wow, the brain's not used to this, it's almost not ready for it, because it's not operating on that level for a long period of time. Anyone that I've met or worked with who has a history of taking things like psychedelics on a regular basis alone without doing any other organic work always ends up with some sort of cognitive issue usually multiple because and this is how the neural link will be it will be okay we've lived our lives doing things that don't optimize our brain's potential and now we're going to take something else that takes us to completely the other end and that's going to result in psychotic and neurotic breakdowns in people because they're just not ready for it it's also going to result in a lot of also mental health issues and it's strange because people say oh yeah well it's built to solve that <laughs> well that's like that's like building a putting a brick down right the first brick of a house and then hoping that a crane can come along and you know do the rest of it right for you you know and suddenly the house is going to be built in a day using all of it it's, it's not how it works right it's a step-by-step -step process each brick counts for another step in ascension so that's why i see the organic route being better engaging in flow state because it's something that isn't governed by us it's not something we need to put in our heads we've already got what we want or need but the reason why people love the idea of the Neuralink sometimes is because it's, again, convenient. It's easy. It's the easy route there. They haven't got to do all the work or anything as well. They say, oh, just put it in my head and I can think better. Sure, if that's the route people want to take, fine. But there's a lot. I've looked at the research. I've looked at the science behind it. And knowing what I know, there is a lot of oversight into the understanding of what's going on behind the Neuralink. Hidden information. That's it. So, where was I going with that? Yes. To answer that second question that you sort of asked within it, organic route always. Always. We've got everything we need. And it will come without the potential side effects of jumping too far, too quickly. Yeah, you know, when you were talking about the neural link, another thing that I think is that, at least that's the impression I get, whenever I see something about this, about enhancing cognitive capabilities with external stimuli, like the neural link or something else. We already live in a world that's very governed by the left brain. And that would be just putting this in overdrive and making it more powerful and more, but it would still be the same kind of thinking, but on steroids in a way. So at least that's the impression I get when they talk about it. That it wouldn't be would to agree, yeah. enhance the creativity or the right brain side or to use both sides of the brain, but to just be faster, be, use more data, that kind of thing. Absolutely. And it's at that point, it's almost like saying, what's the point? Because if you're just amplifying your left brain abilities, well, that's pointless because AI is already taking care of that anyway. You don't, you don't need that anymore as much, right? Apart from basic day-to-day -day tasks so it's it's what's the reason our people are getting it you know if people think if for anyone watching that is if you think getting the neural link to get better at the way that you've always been thinking how you've been raised to think is going to secure you employment in the future I promise you it won't because AI will always be able to do 
left brain process driven things infinitely faster than a human being and it will only get faster as well because it's based on that, that's its design so whether you go the organic route or not got to understand and accept that the creative part of yourself has to be engaged that's that's the future we're going to become creators as opposed to consumers you know it's going to be re-engaging with what we built society upon from the early civilization back to that almost natural state of being so that's got to be the intention got to have that in mind yeah yeah and you know another thing about this about becoming creators instead of, uh, instead of consumers and I think that we were raised as a society to only think about more practical aspects, you know, in a very technocratical kind of way. So, for instance, artistic endeavors are disencouraged by your parents or your teachers when you're growing up because they're like, they're not, they're going to be a starving artist if you do this. So, I, I was in a full art the other day and the speaker said mm -hmm. something like, you know, artists don't know how much to charge because they have this intrinsic motivation to do the thing. So for them, they already got the pleasure of doing the thing, so they don't even need to charge. For them, it's already done. They already got the dopamine and they're already happy about it. And that's why many artists don't know how to charge. And then they end up, like, they charge a tenth of what they should and, and people take advantage of that as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I, I kind of missed some of that because it was kind of in and out. But I heard the the end part especially. It's, it's. Um, I know a lot of the fear around artists and creatives at the moment is that AI is even creating things like art now, generated stuff like that. Will there even be a place for them in the future as well? And I s still stick to the sentiment that, for a niche at least, people will want a story behind the art. That's often what drives people to art in the first place. It's the story behind it. You know, that's why you've got wealthy people paying 20 million for a, a painting that's a dot. Because even though it's a dot, and a two-year-old could do it, it's, it's got a compelling enough story to motivate them. It's got meaning. That's all art is based upon. You know, it's meaning. And that's what encourages and drives people behind it. You know, the, the architecture, let's take, the Renaissance era, one of my favorite eras. The complexity of architecture, by that, it was beautiful, right? It really was, and people loved it because it had deep-rooted meaning in culture. And that's why they appreciated it, not like the square buildings we have now that look like they've been put up in three days. There's no, there's no meaning behind it, there's no wonder behind it anymore. That's why when we go to see, you know, monuments, what, what monuments do we go to see? Is it big skyscrapers or buildings? No, we go to see historic castles, churches, cathedrals, right? Because it's, we know inherently that there's that deeper part of our, not just potential, because it's a reflection of our potential, but of meaning, of our culture, of our history behind that. There's almost this deep yearning to want to get back to that. It really is. So, you know, with artists, I would say retain that creativity, but invoke prioritize more a deep meaning behind everything you do because that's what drives people and meaning is something that nobody can take from you as well that's what drives people that's what puts people there in it and I feel like sometimes a lot of artists focus too much on the art itself and the creating of it as opposed to the meaning behind it and it's easy to do so because it's all just fast fast art now fast fast fashion fast everything so that's, that's, that's a really important part to consider in the future. It's the meaning, meaning behind it. What story is it telling? What does it stand for? What does it represent? Always. Yeah, you know, you mentioned about how nowadays anyone can create anything with AI pretty much. But I agree with you definitely that the storytelling part, the, the meaning, the story behind things will be more valued now because since anyone can do something that looks magnificent, we will kind of get desensitized to looking at things that look impressive. So, yeah. for instance, if you do a video game, you don't. I, I think there will be a tendency in the near future that we go back to focusing more on the story than on the graphics, for example, because 
Like for instance, if you remember some of the old games like Sonic or mm -hmm. Pokemon, the graphics weren't good, but the story was was good and you made that connection with those little monsters on the screen. So mm -hmm. I think that slowly but surely we will get a little bit back to valuing that human aspect. Or for instance, if you see an artist playing live, like a musician, for instance, mm -hmm. and I think since we will get kind of desensitized by so many people making AI music and AI music everywhere, when you see someone actually playing an instrument or someone actually doing a work of art, like you mentioned the cathedrals, for example, like if you imagine how many hours, how many years of human life are there with all of the glasswork and the statues and everything, it, it's amazing. And, and th that's no wonder that if you go to a city like Florence or Rome or even in London, if you go to the right mm -hmm. places, you can see some amazing works. And just by being in the same room as some of those paintings and statues, and you kind of feel different and you kind of, I don't know, you kind of can feel, if you let yourself do it, you kind of can feel the connection to the artist. And yes. All of that was behind them. Uh, yeah, it's, um, because when, as you say rightly, it'll be desensitizing because we're pumping out AI generated art, AI generated everything for so long that the, the image and the visual itself will lose value. So what happens is by human nature, we'll, we'll ensure that it carries on ourselves, right, by our nature. Because human nature is to, if it loses value in something, it will always divert to creating it in something else, creating something else. Let's say I've got a business and I used to be passionate about it, but I'm not anymore. Well, I've got two choices. I can find a meaning behind it create that purpose we don't find purpose we create it um, and we can use that as a value point you know and that'll be the same as art it'll be okay well, I want to appreciate art still but I can't because visually I'm oversensitized so what does it mean what's the story behind it and that's what people will revert to that's why they'll still love the human aspect of it but will because even though AI and here's another factor I think is that even though AI can create amazing images, even if an artist, a human artist, creates something that's still brilliant but is not quite as amazing as that, there'll come a point where just knowing that it's created by a human, seeing a couple of the rough edges and things like that, that will be sentiment enough to say, you know what, a person made that. And the rough edges make it what it is, just the same as the perfections. You know, and that's what's going to drive drive the love of it to continue forward absolutely yes totally the little mistakes are what makes us human and what makes it even more perfect sometimes like i think it was picasso that said that <laughs> the artist he knows all the rules like a professional so that he knows how when he can break them and how to break them so like those little mistakes those little things that aren't perfect are what makes us human in a sense because we're always committing those little mistakes and I think also perfectionism is a very pervasive thing in society that we maybe because when we were growing up we were always like you said in the beginning if you don't use the right word then you get an X on your test so mm -hmm. we kind of get afraid of committing mistakes and then we also because we're so afraid we end up not taking any risks and if you don't take any risks you'll never get anywhere yeah. back to the point of purpose that you also mentioned how can we help people find a purpose in times that are so nihilistic nowadays find something you're good at first get good at a skill and then put the benefits of that skill whether that be financial freedom, time freedom, into a passion. The reason why I say this is I could say the same as every other self-help guru out there, or spiritual guru that says, do what you're passionate about and it'll make you rich. Great. Well, maybe I'm cynical, but <laughs> nine out of ten people don't get rich from their passions. They don't. They get rich from doing something that they're good at. And by being good at it, they 
naturally enjoy it anyway, right? Because it becomes easy to them. But one of my greatest mentors told me this, and he said that, and I rarely take advice from people, not from a, I think I know better than everybody, but because uh, I, lo I love to challenge everything, right? I love to question everything. But this was one of those few times where I couldn't, I had no question for him. And he said that your passions are always what you put more into and what you get out of, generally speaking. And it makes me think of a lot of these wealthy people who make all their money and then what do they do? Well, they've got all the money in the world, so they turn to philanthropy. They start donating big amounts to charities and things like that and doing innovative projects. But to get there, sure, they may still have enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm not saying you've got to do something you despise and hate and makes you feel depressed every day just to get rich. Absolutely not. You know, like it to a certain extent, but liking something and being truly passionate about it are two different things. You know, two very different things. So in terms of linking that to purpose, find something you're good at, make that your first purpose. And then, mm, no, don't make that your purpose. Make that your mastered skill set and then attach and create a purpose behind it. You know, but what what is your why? It could be anything from moving your family out of a rough neighborhood to a better place, but it could be wanting to change the world. The bigger the purpose, the better, because the more reasons you've got to engage in it. So create a purpose, you know, find What's or think about what's already important to you, what you already value, what you already what already drives your emotion, and formulate a purpose around that. For example, if you are creative and you love to create things, okay, well what purpose can you create out of that? Well, you can encourage other artists to build a community and band together instead of being super competitive and uh, you know in this sort of pyramidal state that often it can be in if you're interested in technology right and you're a very analytical mind great that's something you're good at it's from your natural temperament you can turn that into a passion for AI right or wanting to advance technology in relation to human potential as we've discussed today only you'll know what that is but pick your what you're good at based on your natural temperament, learn those skills and build your purpose around that. Because the purpose will come to you anyway. It, w it will be created. And a lot of people try and pick the purpose first without realizing and truly sat thinking about what they're good at or what they could be good at, what skills do they have. And that's why they have such a hard time being able to not just pick one, but stay committed to the purpose. Because they've got that end idea, that end goal, but they haven't yet establish the roadmap to get there. So the roadmap first, skills first, build your passion around that. And that's how you start to really find a purpose. I love that man and I think that it has a lot to do with the story you told in the beginning of after recovering, after going cold turkey and after recovering from anxiety and going through that phase in which you were testing a lot of things and finding out what you actually like, what you were good at and mm -hmm. then discovering that you like to do some creative endeavors as well or rediscovering perhaps. You know, yeah. I think that I think many people get wrong about this whole you should work with your passion kind of thing is that how do you define passion? I think it's not about being necessarily your first love, your first the thing that you most love in the world. Like, I, I knew I wouldn't be a football player, but that doesn't mean that I can find things that I like to do or that, like you said, that you have some kind of aptitude to doing and that you're good at learning it or that you are so interested in that subject that it's kind of a superpower or a, a natural advantage because when other people get tired of studying, you will still be obsessed about it. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like that main passion, but I think you can find subjects that you kind of naturally gravitate, gravitate to and that you will have this natural advantage of wanting to work and maybe it's late at night, but you still want to study more about it. You still need, want to do more and and that other people won't necessarily have.
And I think yeah. that's something that I don't know if it's kind of forgotten when they talk about finding your passion or if it's you do it on purpose just to like take people to the wrong path or something, but <laughs> that's kind of my take on the passion thing. Yeah, I, it's, it's interesting hearing you say that as well because it's, when was, because I'm curious actually on that, when was your first realization of both what you were good at and what you were passionate about? Did you kind of ever blend in that together? Yeah, you know, I think there have many, there have been many times in my life and I'm constantly kind of reinventing myself so it's like many iterations of this yes. so of course if, when I was 11 I wanted to be a football player and then a few years later I wanted to be a rock star and then I was like okay I need to pick something to do in college university so I really liked cars so I became a mechanical engineer but oh, wow. then I, I worked a little bit with that and didn't really like what I was doing, so I started working with things that had nothing to do with that, like the mm. real estate, and then I was really passionate about uh, being creative, and that is the thing that I kind of had lost from my childhood and from my teenage years, about really liking to do things like reading, writing, playing instruments, um, drawing. So mm. I kind of lost that for a while, especially when I was in the beginning of college, I had some bouts of depression and imposter syndrome, so kind of had some years that I had to bounce back from. Yeah. Also some alcohol problems, if I'm totally honest as well, in that stage, so. But going back to the question, yeah, and I think I'm constantly kind of trying to reinvent myself, not, not necessarily that I'm trying to, but I think I'm a person with an obsessive personality, but also with multiple interests, so very polymathic in that sense, so I end up having stages in life in which I do a lot of something and then I'll be obsessed about another subject later on and then try mm -hmm. to work around that. So yeah, I'm not sure if that answered your question completely, actually. No, absolutely. I, it does. Yeah, I, I can relate to that as well. We're very similar in that regard. We both have a sort of a creative streak in us, but it's, we have that curiosity still. It comes back to that, always. It's that innate curiosity, that wonder to explore more and not just be comfortable with where we are and choose to believe that that's life will all, all, all life will ever be for us. You know, that's, that's exactly. the default mindset that has to be, hmm, not mindset, I don't like that word, mind space. Um, that has to be done for the future. Set implies limitation. I, I don't like this, the word set. It sounds limiting, you know. I like space. I can move around there. Um, but no, it's again, I'm excited for the future, um, especially with where we're going, because I know that we've got everything that we need. You don't have to be scared about the future. Definitely not, as, as any of you watching that is. You've got control. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. I'm super excited about the future, but we really need to change our mind spaces individually yeah. and as a society as well. Because I think people are too pessimistic nowadays and they don't really believe in themselves. They don't really believe that they can change, that they can do better, they can be better. And of course, this is a lot of social conditioning, a lot of things that happen when we're growing up and that we kind of put it in our mind and think that life's about that. But yep. at the same time, like we both did, you can change that. You can go into your deeper self and into your neural connections and change that and override the system. And really, I used to be kind of pessimistic because especially of my dad's family, they're very, they have that, you know, self-deprecating humor, that kind of thing. And I used to take that to heart, but nowadays I I never do that anymore. Like, I try to always be lifting people up around me and to just try to, like you said a bunch of times as well, to show them that they can do more, that they have a lot of potential that they're leaving on the table because they don't believe in themselves. 
So I think this is something that we've lost and that we should regain. And I'm happy that there are people in the world like you, Alex, that work with that and that are trying to help uplift other people and uplift society. Hmm. I, I, if I had, because I've run multiple businesses and different things, but at the core of it all, my life's work is human potential. You know, it's advancing that forward because when you advance human potential forward, that advances everything else. Everything else we build, technology, you know, lifestyle, cities, environments, it's all a reflection of the human mind. And even if I wasn't passionate about it, which I absolutely am, I'd still do it because it's a responsibility. I've adopted it as a responsibility now for the future, not just for myself, but for others. I know that it's something that's well, it's needed now, absolutely, but especially will be for the future. And being able to, having the skill sets that I do, it's going to mean that, me personally, I'll always have work in the future because I'll be activating and continue to activate my brain in a way that is polymathic, that is fluid, that is to adapt for that future. That's the very nature of the work I do with not just individuals, especially high-end entrepreneurs, but organizations, teams as well. They're directly affected from this. And that is the common theme when I'm doing work with these companies. It's not just, okay, let's see how we can increase your productivity, energy rates, um, you know, revenue now. It's about how are you gonna be prepared for the future with AI, with potential job changes new technology at the very least being integrated into the workplace with you you know it's preparing them for that future and a lot of the work I also do is based around you know working with a lot of these decision makers living a balanced lifestyle right outside of the work because that's another aspect that affects us in the future we're so busy all the time we don't make time enough time for what really is important everybody has a god whether that be an idea of someone in the sky, whether that be money, stress, anger, greed, alcohol, it's all a god to us. That's something. Everybody has a god, right? But let's redefine god for a second. I'm not talking about a man or a person in the sky. I'm talking about what's called an impersonal energy. It's an impersonal force. It's, you know, you can refer to it as a universe. It's not biased or favoritism. No, it's completely fair. It is per perfectly fair, brutally so. But that is to say that, you know, what do we choose to be our God? Is it things that help us escape? Is it things that ease pain that we can avoid doing? Or is it ourselves? We are our own gods. And I don't mean that in a narcissistic kind of way. I mean that in a matter of we have complete control over our destinies. You know, no one's meant for something or not meant for something. We create meaning. We determine our own destinies, right? That's the nature of human potential. And as soon as people realize that on a mass basis, we'll live in a very different world, a very different world. Massively so. Yeah, I love that. And about this whole idea of the God of, you know, in another conversation, you were mentioning about, you've talked about this already, about how we are all gods and also how we are all connected and yeah. how there's like this universal consciousness, this, this thing that maybe we could call this God as well. Mm -hmm. That we have this spark inside of us and all of us, that's the thing that connects us to the rest of the consciousness and to the rest of people. And how do you see this? And how do you see us being able to leverage this to live a more purposeful life and to help people to be happier, whatever that means. And, and also, in a way, isn't Neuralink kind of the tech trying to emulate what we already have? Like, yeah. Of connecting us to technology, and, but we kind of already have this anyways, in a natural form? 
Yeah, it's exactly it. That's exactly that. It's basically just trying to bring that forward, but it's doing it in a way that's a little bit oversighted, I would say. Yeah, it's one extreme to the other, kind of doing it very, very quick all at once. Um, but in terms of your question about how do we... Forgive me, if you may have sort of rephrased the question just to make sure I've understood it properly. Um, it was, you know, it was about us being all connected and how we don't usually leverage this and we don't usually even think about it. Mm -hmm. And how could we use this godly spark or this interconnectedness to other people in our favor and not in our favor in a Machiavellian way, but, you know, to, to find your purpose and to do things within your purpose, not necessarily like being an asshole or anything, but I, I think you get what I mean. <laughs> yeah, definitely. There's enough of that in the world already. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I would say, first, we've got to understand that the human experience is based on three different dynamics, you know, three different states. So you've got the physical, physical realm, you've got your mental, and then you have your metaphysical, or more commonly known as spiritual. Now, most of us focus purely on the physical and the mental. Some of us even ignore the mental and just focus on what's in front of us, what we can see and touch. Uh, which is why, well, mental health problems are such a pandemic at the moment, <laughs> have been for years. But that is to say that we've lost, or at least we've not lost, but we've been conditioned by the world in a way that's made us forget about that connection to the spiritual part of ourselves and the importance of the mental and maintaining that. So the first step would to be re-establish that connection to that higher source. That's why it's called the high, you know, higher thinking because it's the highest sort of level of thought and frequency that you can engage in as a human being, right? This is why we're all connected. For example, some of you may have heard of something called particle entanglement or quantum entanglement. Simpler explanation to that is we're all made of, you know, particles. And when you have a connection with somebody, even somebody that you don't know, you're connected to them. But when you're connected with somebody personally, that gets stronger. How do we know that this exists and isn't all woo-woo? Well, have you ever thought of somebody that you know or you're close with and suddenly they text you or they call you? Or you see something that reminds you of a person and then suddenly they text you and they call you? It's, or even have the same thoughts when you come out with the same idea and you say the exact same thing to someone in a conversation. That's because there's a, an unseen connection, spiritually, quantum with you and that person and that could be that that that's still there no matter where you are in the universe right you could be on a different planet you could be the other side of the planet to somebody and it's still there so that is to say that that connection is what we've lost forgotten <laughs> not lost actually forgotten um that exists in the first place we've denied ourselves of that so first we've got to accept that that exists and how do we start to re-establish our connection with that well, as, as you know already by, because I sent you the flow state doc, it's engaging in flow state, which is, you know, the creative and the non-creative part of your brain synchronizing. That's your natural state of being. When you do that, you're reforming a strong connection with that, 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 that higher thinking, that power. And that's why when you engage in things like flow state, for example, if you have you ever been in a conversation with a best friend of yours where you just ramble on about everything and anything you haven't got to think about it you're so comfortable with them that you do but the more you talk and the more stimulating it is the more energy you have and it's almost an electric feeling that's your brain basically going bing 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 bing, bing with all these lights <laughs> just lighting up properly um in a state of flow you know it's not limited to do so that's your natural state of being right and engaging in flow state is what re-establishes the connection to the quantum field. And this brings me to a question actually that was asked in X, uh, in the comments. And that was by, I believe, don't quote me on it, Josh Reese, uh, or Mr. Reese, I can't remember the first name, forgive me. Um, Liam. Liam, Liam Reese, that's it. 
sorry bro. Um, <laughs> but that is that is the brain a receiver or what was the other word that you used? Or a transmitter. Transmitter of information, right? Now, on that note, it is actually both. And I'll explain why it is. Again, you've got the spiritual, the quantum realm, then you've got the brain, then you've got the body and the physical realm, right? The brain is a middleman between the physical and the metaphysical, right? From here and here. So, it's a receiver of information in a state, when you're in flow state, you know, it's a receiver of information from the quantum realm, processing it, and then it's a transmitter of information from the mind to the physical realm through, therefore, taking action, creating something. So the brain has the capacity for both. It's not one or the other. But for most people, we only use it as one or the other because, again, process left brain, right? The creative side is the receiver. The process-driven side is the transmitter. That's what it is. And our natural state is being in flow. So that's really where I would suggest the brain lies. It's both. Um, and how, bringing it back to the original question, how do we engage with these understandings? To kind of round off, because I've gone on a bit here, um, <laughs> that's re-establishing connection with the quantum field, spiritual aspect of yourself. That's the infinite wisdom and understanding. How do you do that? You engage in flow state. Of course, anybody watching this, you've probably seen this on Ounce on X, so feel free to hit me up, and I'm happy to send you the free document on how that kind of works. Um, and then start transferring that into the mental, training your brain through flow state to be in that default state. You know, get back to that. And then, using flow state, you can then transfer that into the physical you'll be able to create more. For example, I use flow state to write more, um, faster as well. I'm able to write 3,000 words in an hour on complex subjects, right? A lot of university students struggle to do that in a month on a, something they study every day because of the way they've been conditioned, right? And, you know, you can build more, you know? You can innovate more, more ideas, things come to you because when you're in flow, it doesn't come from your brain, it doesn't come from the thinking mind, it comes from the quantum field. Your brain just receives the information, processes, passes it down, and allows you to take it from that bigger field and apply it. So that's where you've got to start. It's just flow state, and that's how we engage with all three of the dynamics of the human existence. Experience, should I say. Physical, mental, spiritual. You know, it's interesting that you use that metaphor from the question about being a transmitter or a receiver because I've been reading Think and Grow Rich lately and Napoleon Hill uses that metaphor of the mind being sort of both the transmitter like like if it was a radio but it, al it receives and transmits the radio frequencies and also how you might pick upon the thoughts of other people around you as well which is kind of like you said also about someone is going to call you and you think about them beforehand, kind of this clairvoyance yes. kind of situation. You know, a, another thing about the flow state, what's the difference between being in a flow state and acting by instinct? Or would, like you said, since the flow would be the natural state of the human being, would it be just how we should be acting anyway? So that would be the right instinct to have. There is no difference. It's just manifested differently in the body. Right? That's all that is. So it essentially means that flow state, at a very core, one principle to engage in flow state is to not think. Now, when you get a gut feeling, what, what happens? Do you think first or do you get the feeling first? You usually get the feeling, right? And then that starts getting you thinking, okay, why am I feeling like this? What? Something feels off. Well, that's because flow state isn't just something mental. Remember, the mind and the body are connected. They have a symbiotic relationship. Most of us have been conditioned in a way that severed the mind and body connection. That's why people are eating mindlessly and super overweight, because they're not thinking about this stuff. They're, you know, that's a great example of it. Um, like we had experienced in our younger years, 
experiences with addiction, alcohol, for example. You know, others, it's the same. Severed mind and body connection. So instinct is not thinking. Instinct is the natural state. That is flow state manifesting into the body from the mind in its natural state and pouring into it. And here's another example of how you can judge that. Dancers, performers, right? When you're dancing, you're free flow dancing. That's another state of flow, right? That could be manifested. It's a way of life. It's not just brain function. Everything life-wise you experience as a reflection of the brain, right? It's not just there, it's everywhere. So that's really what instinct is. It's not different to flow state, it's just an extension. It's a different manifestation of it. And you know, in the beginning we talked about your origin story, mm -hmm. but we kind of stopped at the moment that you started delving into those many topics and mm -hmm. using your polymathic nature in your favor, <laughs> but we never got into how you started leveraging these skills and this knowledge that you gathered and making it, well, we talked about helping other people, but eventually you turned this into a business. So how did you begin helping other people and then making this business and also? So I began getting into the life coaching world. That's where I started my career. Um, I don't go by that title anymore, but I'll explain why shortly. So I began getting into life coaching, and I started with that for, I'd say, for about my first year and a half, two years as a life coach. Now, I didn't necessarily get the whole certification things. I didn't want to be limited to my ability, but I went through private mentors, paid thousands to people who had already done it. So I started with that, started working with clientele there. But at that time, I was working with specific issues. So it would be things like depression, anxiety, and it was still helping people massively impactful, but there was always another issue that would come up as a substance from life, or a circumstance of life. And I, had, I kind of thought to myself at one point, I thought, well, it feels like I'm working with the symptoms, not the causes. And I realized that that's actually a lot of Maybe this is a bit controversial, but that's actually a lot of what the coaching industry is. Not all. I salute you coaches out there that are generally awesome. <laughs> there are some of you that aren't narcissistic and self-serving and just want to move to Bali and do all that archetype. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but, you know, it's... I, I got to that point and I started not enjoying the industry for that reason. I realized actually, and you know what, I'm just gonna come out and say it, because I think it's really important actually, and a lot of people are suffering because of it. A lot of life coaching, in the way that it's taught to you, is to presume people's problems, when often it's not the case. And I've seen this plenty of times where people, and I know this from working with people now in the way that I do it, who have worked with life coaches before, before they came to me, and a lot of the time I hear people come and say, you know what, I, I was experiencing this issue, so I went to a life coach, and they told me it was something else. So I believed them. And then suddenly I'm working with them, and then I start actually getting the issue that they presumed I had. Misdiagnosis, right? It's, it's, like, <laughs> it's like saying, okay, so I'm, you, they've got their handbook, their little kind of toolkit of, 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 of methods that's very rigid often you know it's not very fluid at all and they, they they religiously stick by that and often people get problems and end up worse than they did before it's often very presumptuous it's not asking enough questions or anything like that so it's all just presumptuous and that is to say back to my point as you guys have probably guessed by now I have a tend to segue but uh, you know such as the nature of flow state always bring it back um, I realized I wanted more than that I didn't want to just work with the symptoms and that's where I started working with um, the association I'm with now as well called Council for Human Development Swiss Association and they are what taught me everything I know now and I now work with them as a main partner in the association too alongside that but that is that they taught me that 
it's working with the origins that matters and they taught me how to do that and again that comes back to why I do what I do now which is an array of topics because I realized each topic has something to contribute that the other one doesn't it gives me a more full picture of what's going on instead of what I was doing in the coaching world and saying oh, okay well I specialize in working with people with depression and anxiety and I use only psychological or NLP techniques you know they're all small parts of a much bigger picture and that's where it elevated me into working as a what I like to call trainer in specifically something called neuroplastic mental acceleration which is what encompasses everything or NMA for short because that's a bit of a mouthful and it's got most of the alphabet in it (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but that's that's where my evolution of work came to and now that's led up to now and how I do my work which means that I'm focusing more on the origins of the problem which is contrary to popular belief the same for everybody identity that autopilot you've been conditioned with that's it of course with different traumas but it all comes back to that at the core of it and it's working with that in a way that helps people not just have to cope with anxiety depression or high stress or imposter syndrome that's what the the medical world tells you and that's what feeds pharmaceutical companies continuously Um, it's working with transcending it to not have to live with them at all sure you may have moments you're human you don't have no emotions but it's very short and you pass through them quickly it's building more of a resilience so to speak and that's that's the nature of my work now Right, and that's that's how I transfer all this into working with people. And I do this in different capacities, which is, first, I work with uh, teams. We work with teams, because I don't act alone in this. Again, it's the association. We've built a whole ecosystem around this. Um, and we work with teams professionally for two purposes. One, to help them actualize their potential in the aid of being able to reflect onto business, because people make a business. No people, you've got no business and also to prepare them, as I mentioned earlier, to adapt to the future with things like AI and new technology. It's inevitable at this point, it's already happening. It's past the point that I like to call point zero, right? Which is where it's past the point of no return. And that's the capacity that I work with groups in. And I can do this individually. We also do it as an association with much larger companies. I also work with decision makers themselves because contrary to popular belief, a lot of these wealthy individuals who are earning multi-millions they aren't just sat on yachts and boats doing nothing some of them are but that's a small exception most of them are actually working 12 hour days slaves to their business barely making time for family and friends and they don't tell you that part because well that's the social media facade of it all right I work with those kind of levels of individuals to bring them a not only a bit more of a life balance, but to also give them the skills, as I give other people, to impact those that they have governance over. Because it starts with those who control things. You know, you've got a decision maker, well, a whole program within the company to advance their team doesn't get approved without the decision maker being on board, right? And these are the people that are pioneering and driving society forward, really. So if we're not working with that, you know, from the bottom up and, you know, the top down, you can do both, by the way, there's going to be no meeting in the middle. So that's, that's my main capacity into where I work with. I also train sales groups, um, public speaking specifically, and how to do that. And also uh, specifically working with communities, right, to be able to really establish a deeper connection with them for that bigger purpose. I run my own communities because community makes the world go round. It's what the world's built upon. You know, the days of hunter-gatherers where we began just as tribes and we thought, you know what, let's make a town. <laughs> that's that's where my work transfers to. So mainly it's teams, high-earning entrepreneurs, and really anybody that is willing to commit to their own potential and believes they even have it in the first place. Yeah, we could segue into so many paths now with this answer that I'm <laughs> even having kind of a hard time picking where we should go with this. I really like the, what you t- talked about, of people thinking about the symptom and not the cause and treating the symptoms and, 
ne never going in, into the underlying issues, and I think that's a big problem. You mentioned also the the healthcare industry that's all about treating the symptoms, and many times they prefer to leave you sick so that you will continue using that medication for the rest of your life, because yeah. that's kind of their business model to be a subscription model. Mm -hmm. But you know, I thought it was really interesting when you were talking about those entrepreneurs and how they also have their own issues and what kind of patterns do you see in those kinds of people? Like, do, do they have a chip on their shoulder? Why do they have that constant quest for wanting to achieve new things? Is What are the patterns that you, you notice in high achieving individuals? Not only entrepreneurs, yeah. but also the leaders that work for them. Yeah. So I see commonly, there's, there's lots, but I'll kind of nail it down to the big three I see the most. The first is they deny their pain. They work through their pain. And what I mean by that is not literally working through it, but they, instead of dealing with pain and going to therapy or seeking help, they will work more hours or focus on their mm -hmm. business because they believe that as long as they're problem solving in their business, and they're problem solving in their head. Not necessarily the case. They think that that's solving the problem, but it's not, it's just burying it. It's denying it. That's it, it's denying that it's there and forgetting about it in the first place. And it always creeps up bigger and badder every time to the point where a lot of them actually end up experiencing things like burnout, um, some, some even mental breakdowns, right? And some to the point where they just lose all motivation, sense of purpose, self and everything. That's the first one. So they deny pain and work through it instead of facing it. The second one is that they often don't, they make their business their identity, right? That's a huge one. That's probably the number one, I would say. They allow their business and their achievements and everything to become their identity. And this is often why a lot of them fear delegating because they don't believe anyone can do what they do to the way they do it. And actually, more than most people probably can, they just need to be trained correctly, right? Um, and then also, they, 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 the reason why they do this as well is because they think that there's no sense of worth beyond that. They don't think about themselves in terms of potential. They think about themselves in terms of certainties. This is what I've experienced. This is what I can do and have done. So this is what makes me me, as opposed to this is what I could be beyond what I do and what I am, right? They see their businesses, who they are, as opposed to an extension of their potential. And what that does is it increases high levels of overwhelm and stress, which is the third thing I see most in them, just high stress levels, excessive stress levels, because they have this unconscious fear that if they stopped working or they sold a business and they decided to do that thing where they decided to relax and just do what they wanted, they'd lose all sense of purpose which, yes, to a certain extent is true, but the reason why that happens is because, again, it's the identity. They think that what they do is who they are, it's not. You can be whatever you want, right? You've got potential to diversify into anything, to try anything. So they fear of almost letting go of businesses. And a lot of the time, that actually hurts sales, it hurts um, you know, the team morale as a whole, because that transfers into everybody else in the team. If their leader is exhibiting that and embodying that, well, they're going to set the example. So that transfers into their teams. So it was they make their business identity. That's the first thing. Number one, instead of seeing it as an extension of their potential, they, um, they, gosh, what was the second thing I said? It was... Talk about identity, but about... Uh, being constantly stressed about not being able to constantly. let go and yeah I remember now it's been constantly stressed and um, it was basically that they gosh it's gone again flow state does that by the way guys one thing you'll learn in flow state is when you're doing it you're not thinking so you very rarely remember anything you've just said that's a good sign by the way <laughs> um, oh, it's good to know that it's a good sign <laughs> yeah yeah no honestly it's because it's, it's not repetition it's coming from somewhere fresh right um, but yeah, so that is, gosh, yeah, that's it. They're a slave to their business. They have very little time to 
focus on what matters, you know, to live. They work too many hours. They do that because they identify with their business, they think it's them, and that's what d determines them and their value in the world. And they are highly stressed because of this. So if I would say go in that order, because each is a precursor to the next issue, basically. And those are the three biggest things I see, not just in decision makers, but management. Hell, even on, you know, the minimal to lower levels of employment, on the ground floor. This is kind of a common thing with everybody in any job role. Is there such a thing as work-life balance, especially for those people on the upper rungs of the ladder? There's no such thing as true exact balance, because, well, it oscillates. However, there's picture a wave, right? You've got two waves, two charts. The top wave is oscillating really, really big like that, right? You know, it's very, it's working in extremes. Then you've got the second one, it's still oscillating, because it has to, but it's more balanced, it's not as volatile, it's, it's quite integrated, it's more flowy as opposed to violently going like that. That is how I would describe a work-life balance. It'll never be a straight line, but it's about maintaining the extremes into a fairly integrated way of life, right? Because all life is existence, as a human, is a constant balance between order and chaos. That's the very fabric of the universe itself, existence. It's what makes reality. They coexist. And business owners, they fall so much into either order or chaos in its extremes. So I would say there is a work-life balance. And the way that you do that, I've actually got a document on that as well, funnily enough, I recently created, is by not trying to deny one or the other it's by integrating them. most people try to deny chaos because they seek order or the other side is that they're they don't like order and they're completely chaotic they don't like having any boundaries but again like we said in flow state creative non-creative chaos order right you're integrating that so it will oscillate there will be times and days where it's a bit more chaotic than it is ordered but it's flowing more. It's not extreme where you're having a month of full chaos and then a month of everything going perfectly. It's day to day, you know, even in sort of the moment to the moment, right? And that's what really is a work-life balance. It's learning how to transcend or not transcend, but flow with the nature of the universe itself, not try to battle against it. Because when you battle against it, you battle against yourself. So it's about knowing that you never be fully balanced, it will never be 50-50, and you kind of have stages or phases in life in which you will have to be 90-10 into one direction or the other because life happens and you yeah. need to to keep the plate, the, the ball spinning or the plate spinning. And what else? And we'll speak about something else when we were talking about this. And, and how can we reconcile the stages in life? Because there are stages in which we will feel more energetic and in which we can create or we can work more. But mm -hmm. also, I think there are stages in which we don't have that energy or even that will to be so productive. Um, how can we reconcile, reconcile with being or with thinking that maybe the most productive way of being is not to be 100% productive all the time? Again. I would, you know what, I could answer, I could answer that one way, but I want to give you something different, just for variety purposes. Uh, by changing your relationship with work, the meaning itself, at the very core, change your relationship with it. And it's by moving from something called deficit needs in psychology to aspirational needs. Now. This is something that was, as a model, created by a renowned psychologist by the name of Abraham Maslow. Some of you may be familiar with him. Um, but he basically made a pyramid. And there's different variations, but I believe there's eight, seven or eight def you know, core needs. Now, the first ones are things like um, survival, you know, so you've got shelter and things like that. Sharing, showing. So, for example, got a homeless person who then elevates to finally finding themselves a bit of work, uh, work let's say let's say as a dustbin man and then that means he's got money coming in maybe he gets his first apartment 
He's got a shelter now. Now he's got some stability. He wants to find himself a wife, have a kid, or a husband, whichever you're into. Um, and <laughs> then, and then you know he's got a kid now and a wife. And now he's upgraded his house, and he's doing pretty well for himself. You know, he's, he's now working in a management role. So now he wants to show people what he's got, what he's built, right? But then that's usually as far as people go after that. They don't really go any further, but that's the deficit needs. That's the survival rooted needs. The aspirational needs are where we get into something called self and social actualization. Now, everybody prioritizes self actualization, but you've, it's what's been forgotten is another level to that. And again, this comes from the Western watered down version of this because it uh, prioritizes, as we said at the beginning, individualism. Go your own way, be the lone wolf, and it's all about you. Um, but the self-actualization is where you're exceeding just the needs. You're doing things because you can. You're excelling in things. You're trying new things. Maybe mastering a martial art and different languages or, in this case, the ideal situation, accelerating your brain beyond the way that you currently think. Uh, and then you get to social actualization, which is where it's not just about you and your little bubble anymore. You move from something called the I focus to the us mentality. Now the I focus again is what most of us are conditioned with. It's about I'm happy in my little corner of land and patch, F the world, nothing else matters. But then the social actualization, that us mentality is where you say, you know what, I want to bring change. I want to do something more beyond just myself. I want to start helping people. You know, I want to have an impact of some form. Leave the world in a better way than it was before. And that's really where you start to excel beyond and away. You know, there's there's no stopping you then. And it's momentum game. So bringing it back to the original question, which is how do we moderate that balance between having those quiet down days and those super productive days is don't judge yourself for it, but think about where you're operating in that scale of deficit needs to aspirational needs, that pyramid at any given time. It's the, the why is the important part because again that's how you moderate that balance between order and chaos. There's going to be times where you've got to focus purely on survival which is bringing order and then you've got a point where you've got to uh, you know, be able to create new things, explore new things, you're willing to tread into chaos beyond need just because you can, right? So moderating that and constantly calibrating yourself as to where you are in that frame and is it a good idea to be in there? Is it maybe better to elevate or think in a different way on that scale based on the situation? That's how you do it, really. Because most of the time, the reason why people can't, don't understand how to moderate that isn't because it's the practical itself that's hard, it's justifying it to themselves. Yeah, thank you. Because, you know, last month I got sick and I think I still derive too much of my self-value from the things that I do. So since I wasn't being productive, I, I kind of felt bad about it, even though I was sick. So when I realized this, I didn't think about it from in terms of the Maslow hierarchy of needs, though it, it is a good framework, so next time I'll keep that in mind. But when I finally decided to let go and was kind of intuitively realized what you just said and I was like, you know what, just let's focus on recovery and whenever we're ready, we'll get back to doing whatever we need to do. And that was the moment that I actually started recovering faster, or at least I had that impression because I guess I wasn't spending that mental energy uselessly just thinking about stuff that I should be doing should also unfold and, and then that's when I started getting better and now one month later I feel much better than I was before getting sick so yeah. I guess like you said we have those stages and we kind of we need to let go of things and not be anxious about things that much and wanting to control everything and of course we have the free will and we want to in a way control things and you know self-actualize as well i think this is part of because like we said in the beginning as well a lot of 
what leads people to habits that are not healthy or even vicious habits is that feeling of helplessness of not being in control of basic things but at the same time we want to control everything if we want to hold on to things too much then we also end up being too anxious about things and if something doesn't go exactly like you want it to or if someone says something that you didn't expect them to say and then you're so pissed about it and you never enjoy anything because you're always trying to control everything and becoming yeah. a control freak so yeah i think thinking of the maslow hierarchy is interesting in those cases and also sometimes the person might be super self-actualized or like a nobel winning scientist or something but the guy simply didn't eat right that day and so his blood sugar is low so he falls back on the pyramid again even though he is and by all means he is super actualized but that day or at that time specifically he won't be because he has a more urgent a more pressing need no you're absolutely right and that's actually something i wanted to stress the importance of as well this 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 model i've just laid out for you guys it's not about being in one state for as much as you can that higher state no as i said before that's that that framework is a psychological model that again represents those waves i described between order and chaos right so there will be times where in one aspect of your life maybe in your business you're in a very needs based survival sort of you know way of thinking because maybe there's been a problem or there's been a maybe a big outage like there has been today with windows and microsoft and stuff where you know, the world's almost gone to chaos for a little bit. But then in other aspects of your life, when you come home, you may have a beautiful marriage, beautiful family that's really lovely, and everyone gets on well, and you're very happy. And you can focus more on wondering further and doing things together and those more aspirational needs. So it's not a set-in-stone situation. And you've got to look at all of your fundamental life dynamics, which generally is made up of five, I would say, um, which I can get into... Uh, at, a, at another point or if you think it's beneficial I can do now but, but the main point is that you will fluctuate between them all so don't judge yourself for any of them right it's about being able to of course you always want to strive to maintain those top aspirational levels don't judge yourself when you fall back down you're human you're not AI AI is what stays up there all the time why because it doesn't have emotions <laughs> emotions are energy in motion Order and chaos are both forms of energy that make up that God frequency that we talked about, that, that higher frequency. And you're a product of that. You are the universe. You are existence. You're just a different manifestation of it. And the gift that you have, that most of the species on the planet do, or don't, is the ability to ascend past survival-based needs. When you start working with someone, um, you a leader or with a company, what are the first things that you notice about them and when you're trying to think about how can I help this person, what, what kind of, what, what's on your mind when you're trying to map out what are their issues or struggles and mm -hmm. because also so many times people try to bullshit themselves so they won't actually tell you the the real deal or sometimes they don't even really know it because they don't have that self-knowledge enough self-knowledge to know it so how do you guys begin the process so we begin by well there's two main parts there are body language and there's verbal language now we have identified common quantifiable through data language patterns that everybody uses. Now this is where we use the skill of NLP as a part of our much bigger sort of skill set, right? We listen to language and we can tell that even if a person's lying to themselves or us, because we know what the language means on an unconscious programming level, we know how to get behind it. We know what they're actually saying versus not what they're not saying, you know? For example, um, I believe is a common one or I think. Now most people when they put that forward they say I believe or I think very passionately as if to say you know this is my truth this is the truth 
but what those language patterns actually mean is as an unconscious self-doubt or self-defeat or uncertainty within what they think because I believe well a belief is a potential not a fact or a certainty I think suggests that oh, okay it's I think I don't know you know it's uh, again a potential so you see that we understand the unconscious meanings behind that what it actually does to the brain versus the mask that people put on towards people for keeping themselves secure in their sense of identity um, you know wanting to be an authority figure not wanting to be looked down upon or thought themselves as stupid so those are example of language patterns and how people use them as a mask but what they actually mean commonly and then we use of course body language which is classic that's nothing existential um, or new but that is especially when we're in person people are tapping a lot or they're playing around with things that suggests anxiety again with their eye contact if they can't keep eye contact or um, you know they're sort of talking sporadically but there's no real order to it they're just kind of saying mindless nonsense again these are signs of anxiety because what that all means behind the scenes is yeah they're putting on a strong front but it's showing complete chaos inside they're being challenged in a certain way they don't want to have to think a different way or have their mind changed you know so those are the two main aspects it's through language and through body but there's another one something that is less commonly used because only a very few people have this ability everybody could have it but most don't actualize it and you know earlier I was talking to you guys about quantum entanglement and that infinite connection well when you start to get to a certain point in what we like to call the ascension path you know with humans and, you know further up in potential you start to be able to feel people's emotions and intentions it's very strange I can't describe it and I don't mean it in a like I said earlier I'm presuming what you um, think or feel you know like the coaches often do it's in a way where you get when you're in flow state of course it gets downloaded to you you know that connection that you have through quantum field to that person they're sending data from you or from them to you so for example how this plays out in meetings is sometimes when I'm getting to know a person I'll be saying what are some of the problems you're facing at the moment and they'll say five ten different issues but none of them will be the actual problem they'll just be symptoms and then I'll say something to them like oh okay so it's fear that drives you and then they go how did you get to that I haven't even thought about that before but I think you're right <laughs> because how am I doing that again you read between the lines but I'm also it's hard to describe without experiencing it but something just tells me instinct that's it it's instinct again it tells me that because I'm in a state of flow I'm not thinking about what it could be or what I think it would be you know it's not based on what I already know or my little tool book it's a certain inner wisdom that you adopt and that you can develop and that also comes from pattern recognition which I discussed as well is that frequencies contrary to popular belief happen in cycles as well so frequencies are created by human emotions at least in the way humans experience it which is energy that's put out there through action and that's what creates a frequency so when people are heavily emotional or they're dealing with issues then that creates a certain frequency in the air so for example if you tap into this you'll know if someone's feeling anxious or nervous because you'll start to feel it in the air you know you'll suddenly notice your temperature slightly increase you know or maybe you're sweating a little bit or maybe your heart rate increases somehow or maybe your, your, your mind starts to wander a little bit you know these are things people don't think about but it's because you're connected to these people in a way that everyone's a reflection of you really so that's the third aspect of how we understand that and that that that's a skill you develop that a little bit further down it's more advanced but can do it it's through actually being connected and 
establishing that connection to the quantum field through flow state and allowing the connection you have with a person on a particle level to give you that data. And that's what allows me to be able to have a person talk about anything and everything but the problem and still know what the problem is at a core. You can read between the lines. It's an inner wisdom. So that is body language, language, verbal language, and frequency. Does it get a bit overwhelming when you can feel the other people's emotions and when you can, especially if you are in a room with a lot of people and if you are a very sensitive person or a person that's attuned to this already, can it be overwhelming? And also, when you're talking to them, and you said you enter a full state, so do you really, as consciously, are you not thinking anything? You're just like being present? How yes. do you do it? And then you, you speak to them without even thinking, without filtering, just being completely present and just speaking whatever comes to your mind or your heart? Yes, that's exactly it. I, I don't go into any meeting, whether that be a current client or a new client, with any expectation. Right? Sure, maybe I'll go in with a schematic or something that we're going to do in a lecture or something like that. But even then, that's done in a flow state and just expanded upon. But when I'm listening to them, especially in the beginning state where I'm hearing about what they're going through and we're kind of doing what we like to call mind mapping, right? A person. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no thought. Any instant you know, wisdom or understanding or suggestions that I get of what a person's going through is purely from what they tell me. And what I can feel and sense, I think sense is a better word, not feel, uh, sense from that. And that's what allows me to be so efficient and very rarely wrong in any of my conclusions that come from that. Um, and I'll, like I said, often the case is people haven't even dug that deep themselves. So, you know, it's almost, it's weird. It's almost like sometimes you know people better than they know themselves. <laughs> and it sounds really egotistical and narcissistic to say that, but it is what it is. That's, a, that's, that's just how to describe it. If, and you know what? If that were true, people wouldn't be struggling with themselves mentally so much. If they truly knew themselves in the way that they did, right, better than anybody else, they'd know exactly what they need to do to transcend these issues, but they don't. So I beg to differ. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I don't think it's egotistical at all because, like you said, most people, they don't, well, first of all, maybe they don't even know that they could know they, their selves better. Maybe they think they know their selves, but they don't know how much they don't know about themselves. So sometimes when someone like you comes in and you're able to pretty much see through them and see yeah. all of their fears, all of their limiting beliefs with just a five minute conversation, they might feel like, is this guy a psychic or something? But I've been told that numerous times. Yeah, I can imagine, man. Oh, gosh. It almost does feel like that though, it does. It almost is like that. It's very strange when you first learn it. And do you think it's more about pattern recognition because you've studied so much about it and you've seen a lot of people talking and you kind of get that pattern recognition factor? Or it's also about being in the flow state and letting like the collective consciousness kind of help you with that as well? or? our natural instincts that we as humans don't usually use because we kind of forgot about how to use them. What do you think are the main factors coming in? I would say both, but in different, different purposes. So pattern recognition generally comes better from noticing the symptoms, right? So most people experience some form of um, you know, depression or anxiety at some point in their life, high stress to a certain degree. And the reasons why are commonly the same too but the flow state comes into it for the specifics. Those are the things that, that's where I get wisdom and downloads from things that are very personal that even people close to them probably wouldn't know, right? And it's really strange where, I'll give you an example actually, I was on a call yesterday and I was with this, this, this woman, I won't disclose obviously for confidentiality reasons, but I was with this woman and it was the first call we had and she was basically dealing with a mix of issues 
but one of them was that she had immigrated over to Canada from India and she found a partner who they you know got married because well one they'd fallen in love and two because there were legal benefits to her citizenship that benefited from that right now her husband's going through lots of issues and stress and she's going through a lot of stress too because their relationship is taking a toll on it and I said there's a deeper issue here though isn't there she told me all of this and I said there's a deeper issue and she hadn't mentioned anything about it at the time and I said your, your relationship with your mother is where this is really coming from isn't it she wow. says well, how the hell do you know that and I said well it's clear to me from what you've told me you have very few people around you in your life friends family at least locally to you otherwise if you had people to talk to you wouldn't be on the phone to me and your husband is stressed and going through his own issues so he doesn't even have the capacity to help you out at the moment and be supportive now you haven't mentioned anything about your family at all especially when I asked you about who do you have around you so that tells me that the fact you didn't even have to mention your family or feel the need to means that they're that absent in your life that you don't even feel like they're even there right and that was the word for word pretty much where that came from she made no mention of it right and she said well that's absolutely right and then we get in a whole conversation about that but that's an example of how flow state works you know pattern recognition happens with the symptoms the surface level stuff but the flow state that that's where you get the download from the quantum field that that infinite source and that's where you really get to the core of the issue you know that's how you know you're in flow you can't guess that stuff you know you can but you're probably going to be wrong if you're trying to do it based on analytics alone no you, it comes from that that's how that manifests and do you think when you're doing it in person as opposed to when you're doing it on a video call or on a phone call do you think it's easier for you to recognize those patterns or to because of course when you're in person it's you have more cues about yes. the person and sometimes you can even like we talked before you can even kind of read their minds quite literally because kind of their mind is transmitting the radio frequencies so do you think it's easier when you're in person versus when you're on a video call or something else yeah definitely of course just by just by numbers probability right the information like you said cues and data but I still you know like to use zoom because you still get a basic bit of body language but even then when you learn enough body language I would say is the least data field source of information I find that we get more data from words as well as from the flow state but don't get me wrong it's still very important it plays a big part but in my experience you can do this on the phone to people right because their words and the tonality you hear it in their voice and things like that uh, that gives more away because you also have people that are very good at controlling their body language but are still very you know suggestive with their words in terms of giving it away because people know body language gives cues away and gives information away so most people will actually try their hardest to contain that because they don't want to give it away so yeah I would say body language is third on the scale and then you've got the language patterns and then you've got a flow state simply because of how specific it is yeah you know it's interesting I've thought about X spaces right now and how because it's just voice based or now they have video as well but it used to be just voice based and you could get a very intimate conversation with people that you barely know yeah. and I think this is one of the main reasons because you weren't seeing the person so you kind of opened up more and you were able to say things that without thinking too much because sometimes when you're face to face you kind of either because it's a lot of information and you're trying to process all of that but also I think because I don't know there's something there's an aspect about just communicating vocally that kind of leads you to being able to to speak more truthfully and not to think too much yeah absolutely it's it's a comfort thing it really is everybody has a mask and what these spaces do is it allows people to not have to keep a mask 
on the contrary, some people actually have more of a mass, right? Because they don't have the accountability. <laughs> Depends on which side of the moral spectrum you fall, I suppose. You know, we all have them. And what that does is, which is I find space is really more insightful, is because people aren't pressured to have the physical cues, they give more away in their words normally than they would. Right? They speak more, they let out more because they feel more confident to do so, which is why I said that the words are much more insightful and data filled because words are what give us a sense of power. You know, this is why the freedom of speech is preached so much. It's, it feels like it creates a sense of power that we have, right? And when faced with the choice of action or speaking, people will always speak the words first before taking action because they feel like well that's the one thing they do have true control over they can physically try something and fail but if they speak well what they say is what they say yeah i agree with that and i think also one of the things about not having to show yourself is that many people have deals with their well insecurity about their appearance about many times about small details that no one else would notice but for them it's something important so they mm -hmm. have the insecurity and yeah. they aren't able to open up as much as they would but also what, what was the second thing you said again it was talking about the masks but also how people talk about how people speak as well and they choose to speak instead of take action physically oh yes but then you also talked about freedom of speech and yes. I think that's also an interesting one because, you know, words have power and we can, you talked about neuro-linguistic programming, for instance, and how the words that we speak to ourselves or that the words that we use um, on a regular basis to speak to other people as well, how they change, how we perceive the world and, and also they, they mimic how we, how our inner self sees the world, I guess. Yes. And how, when talking about freedom of speech and also how this relates to freedom of thought as well, because when you are constantly thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't say this or I shouldn't say that, because if I say this, people will think that I am such and such way. They will think that I'm a bad person for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And little by little, you are also taking away from the freedom of thought in your own mind because some things start becoming unthinkable. Yeah. And I think it can become dangerous if we go too much into that path of going away from being able to think and say things freely. But also, how can we reconcile that with, you know, of course, there are things that kind of are dangerous if people end up actually doing them. So. It's hard to reconcile sometimes those dualities that we have. Yeah. I actually have a thought on this and it's a little bit, take it neutrally, but it's a little bit kind of, one could say controversial. Freedom of speech, and I'm all for freedom of speech, absolutely. But freedom of speech, you ever notice that the people that are so more, so passionate about it and find it so much more important to them are those that aren't super wealthy, super rich, controlling the world, right? And then you find the people that aren't so bothered about it, they don't really feel the need to talk too much, are those who are successful. Well, one of the reasons, and this is not me saying you should or shouldn't exercise freedom of speech, your reasons are your own, but one of the biggest reasons why people feel so passionately about having a voice is because that is the only sense of power they feel they have in their own life. That's it. They feel the world's against them, and the, you've got wealthy people and people in power, politicians and everything, and, you know, they could be living so much of a better life, but there's a void there. So when they feel like they don't have power anywhere else in their life, they use their voice. Now, you'll find, and I've already started to experience this, don't get me wrong, I can get on and wax lyrical about anything and everything as I have with my friend Gabriel here today as well um, for hours but it's for the sake of progress I'm doing this to help right to, to advance something but otherwise 
I personally find myself preferring not to say anything more than I do because I know what I need to do I've got a clear path ahead of me and sometimes people talk in spaces to people as a way of not just finding themselves and understanding something about themselves but as a sense of power so freedom of speech is a source of power for those they feel have none anywhere else in their life but it's a starting point for them to build power in other areas of their life in other words what am i doing or what am i saying do more speak less and when you do speak make sure it hits speak of your actions right Yes. But you know, I, I think it's a very interesting point about these people feeling powerless. And how could we help people? Of course, they, they need to want to, but <laughs> people who want to feel more empowered, and, and not in a, the way that people usually use this word nowadays, but truly <laughs> empowered, like, like they have some sense of control in their daily lives. Of course, we talked about uh, finding something that you can become good at be it a hobby, be it a skill that you can eventually turn into a profession. Mm -hmm. But in, in what ways could these people kind of take control of their lives in a way that they won't feel so such strong emotions about having or not freedom of speech or about mm -hmm. thinking about how the big guy is you know, making their lives worse, oh it's all about the politician, it's all about it's a it's always about someone else, but never about them. But how yeah. can we help them take back the reins of their own lives and their own little problems? First is to start, if, if, if you're somebody that has skill sets that can help people with this, like myself, or even if you're someone that needs help with that themselves. First, excuse me, first of all, realizing you've got everything you need already. You've got a brain that has the ability to grow as far as you want it to grow every single day you've got a creative part of yourself you've got a process part of yourself you can write you can think you can speak you can imagine you've got everything you need so that's the first part is realizing actually 95 percent of what you need doesn't come from out there it comes from in here now you've heard this plenty of times from plenty of other people so that's nothing new but i'm going to tell you in a way where you know what that thing is not just a nice sentiment of saying it's all within you. Okay, well, what's within you? Well, like I said, you've got the brain. You, fun you know, you, you grow that every single day, right? Using things like flow state to accelerate that. And as long as you, every single day, step one bit closer to your potential, the more the better, right? Of course, we have those rest days. We are human. Just never stagnate. Always go forward. Because when you stagnate, very quickly that turns into regression. If you're not going forwards, well, you're probably going to go backwards. Because there's always got to be a direction in the universe. Always. And the second thing I would say is find or build your own community. This is something that's overlooked massively, again, in the Western world. Don't buy into this, you've got to do it alone. Nobody understands me. Rubbish. Uh, that is, in my view, uh, that is a egotistical, narcissistic projection from highly successful people that don't know how to empathize. Some may hate me for that, but here I am. Um, but that's what it is. It's not that people don't understand most of the time. You just don't take enough time to understand other people. Because when you do, and I'll tell you this, because I have lived this mentality before, it's because you don't realize how similar you are to people until you actually speak to them. This whole idea of, you know, isolating yourself and cutting yourself off from people, I agree with it if it's cutting off people that aren't healthy for you. But there's a period where you go through isolation to build and discover yourself more, and then there comes a point where you have to share that with other people. So it's not that there aren't many people like you out there, right? Sure, there may still be an exception, but there's more than you think out there. You've just got to put yourself out there. They aren't isolating you, you're isolating them. And this is an unconscious behavior. So build community, because not only then have you got the affirmation and security of knowing that you've got everything you need, you're taking control of your part, you know, 
what you can do with your potential, your body, mind, spirit, every day. But you've got people around you to add on to that. Because again, with particle entanglement, that overall connection, there's something called a resonant frequency. And it's any individual has one. Me and you have one right now, Gabriel, between us, right? We're two people with an energetic force. Towns, villages, whole cities have them. You know, a whole planet has a resonant collective frequency. So by having community, it reinforces what you're already doing. Therefore, in relation to, you know, freedom of speech, you'll find that you can you still speak out and be passionate and say what needs to be said for the sake of progress. Go for it. But you'll find that you'll shift from doing it because of a need to doing it because you feel you want to. Not because you feel you're powerless, but because actually it's coming from a source of power. Not as opposed to coming from a place of trying to gain power through it. And that's the shift that will be made. Because you'll be with like minds where you can discuss these topics without fear of judgment. Where you feel like you're not the only one in the world that's thinking the way that you do. And most of the growth that the brain does, statistically, you know, this is thanks to neuroscience, is actually through the work with other people. Why? Because you've got the intake of knowledge, that's 20%, anyone can consume. But then you've got the practice of knowledge, which exercises the muscle. Like watching a, a gym workout once, and then following that same workout from that video for three months. You're going to see more growth in your body than you will in the mind just from taking in that video. You know, it works the same way, and you do that with other people. Compounding effect. So, realize your own potential. Find others as well that do. They are out there. You've just got to look far enough. And frankly, if you've developed that far enough and you're truly who you are, being in that state will be its own filter system. People that aren't interested in you won't bother with you. People that are, they will. It's that simple. Yeah, you change yourself and you change the world. and People start resonating with you and I mean, people in the same frequency or with similar interests will always resonate, but if you change how you perceive the world and you say, I want to be more a more positive person, so I want to perceive the world in a better way, I want to be more grateful for the things I already have, and the, things, the smallest of things are actually the biggest of things, yes. just being able to wake up and having two legs and being able to walk freely and look at the sky and those little things that we yeah. take for granted and imagine to someone on their deathbed wouldn't they love to be able to go on a stroll in a, a, a warm evening in the summer and have some ice cream or some small thing like that that pretty much anyone can do of course they would yeah. but we take so many things for granted and always on that hamster wheel and only thinking about onto the next and work, work, work. And even people who think about work are even the worst. There are people who only think about things like sports betting or things like, you know, what's on social media, celebrities and whatnot. And there's so much more to life that we can do, so much more that we can actualize. but. Unfortunately, most people still don't do this, but hopefully we're doing our part in spreading the message and encouraging people to go more into this path of self-actualization, of self-empowerment in a way. There was something that, uh, oh yeah, I remember it in, in the forum mm -hmm. that, you know, one of the things I ask people is about what's your flavor of weird? And you talked about liking blues, you talked about liking psychoanalysis and re-watching Dune every two months, which really I thought was very weird. But the thing that stood out to me the most actually was that you said that you're very interested in tyrants and conquerors. No. And do you think that your name has anything to do with that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's definitely one factor, yeah. I was named indeed after Alexander the Great by my parents. They told me that, not me. No self-fulfilled prophecy here, I promise. Um, 
But then the other reason is just through my occupation. But there's a specific reason that's personal to me. And that is my fascination with understanding power. My reasons for wanting to understand power is for good purposes to help people. But a lot of people idolize these individuals and they look into them and they want to embody them and things like that because it speaks to a certain nature in us. We have that in us, just the same as the good people. But for me, it was, you can learn a lot from them because they do a lot of things that we don't very well and vice versa. And it sort of thought, you know what? Why not study the extremes? I could do what most other people do and just focus on, um, you know, the good people, the good leaders, the people that are considered heroes and good people. But if I really want to understand and have a complete understanding of this experience, you know, what it means to be human and our potential, I've got to get my hands in the mud, brother. I've got to get in the dirt. I've got to, you know, see the ugly side of stuff. And I won't disclose some of the the um, ugly side of things I have experienced, whether that be people or things, and some of them, it's enough to keep even the strongest minds up at night, but fortunately it's, and it doesn't anymore, but that is to say that it's taught me a lot about the darker parts of ourselves, and I would actually contribute that having that interest and continuing to has attributed significantly to my ability as a trainer, as a practitioner, as ability to help somebody. Because it's easy to deny the darker parts of ourselves and just focus on the good and the, the happy, fluffy potential. But by been denying those parts of ourselves, we usually end up becoming slaves to them. We're running from them. So that's the deeper personal reason why. It's because I wanted to just go fully in. I wanted to understand everything. Not just cherry pick it all and what makes me feel good darker, dirtier parts of it all as well. And yeah, that's that's that. <laughs> that's my why. Awesome. Yeah, we tend to run away from those darker parts of ourselves and of course there are some cultural factors. Like in the in the Christian world, for instance, there's the topic of sin, so you don't want to even consider that you're able to have those sinful thoughts. Many yep. people take that to heart and they really try to hide it, but then many times that same person ends up doing the same thing in the most egregious manner because they're, they have that duality inside of them. Yep. But yes, how can we reconcile with our shadow? So I also do a lot of work with this as well, specifically for people. Shadow integration, actually. And um, the simple terms is, because it's a very complex process and it is individual, but something I can give you guys is that, first of all, don't deny those parts of yourself. Don't run from them, because eventually you'll, it's like keeping an infestation in your house. If you ignore it, it's just going to get worse and worse over time. Right, bigger and bigger. But what I would say is that there's three principles to consider when looking at shadow integration. There are parts of that your shadow that you let go of, parts of your shadow that you manage, and then parts of your shadow that you embrace. So for example, a part of person's shadow that's commonly good to let go of is resentment. That's a very dark part of a person and that can and does often lead people to do some very heinous things. You know, people have killed people over far less than resentment. And you know, and worse. But that's an example of something you let go of. Then you have something like anger. So anger is actually a very powerful emotion. It's a great source of energy if you manage it and learn how to channel it, right? So that's something you'd more manage, right? You don't want to embrace anger, because embracing anger is where it takes over, so to speak. Um, and that's often a very fine line, you know? It's like telling the kid to, oh, okay, if someone punches you, you defend yourself. And instead, he goes and beats the, the living daylights out of him instead of just giving a punch back, right? 
You know, you're not specific, but in his head, because kids are, they take things at face value, he goes, okay, so do my worst. That's, that's, that's it. So that's, that's an example of anger in a person and how you want to manage it instead of embracing it. And you can channel that into where often I'll encourage clients to pick up things like debates, right? Learn the art of debate and non-combative argument. Um, a martial art, that's another one. That's great for fueling anger, right? You can put it into your body. Anger is one of the most powerful f forms of energy and emotions to transfer into your body. And then you've got something that you'd embrace. Now, something you would embrace is, for example, um, that could be ruthlessness, right? You can embrace that, but then you can embrace it in a way that is you know, with good intentions. You, you're in control of what, how you want to use that. That's just a moral compass and whether you have one or not, or you even care to develop one. But, you know, ruthlessness can be really good to embrace because that can transfer over into business, into, um, you know, even yourself, regardless of other people. Being able to achieve, being so dedicated and driven, almost in a John Wick-like fashion where he'll just do anything from sheer will because he's just pure ruthless but he achieves it right he's when he has something in his mind he he goes after it so you see here these are different examples of emotions and parts of what person comes up with within the shadow that you either let go of manage or embrace and think about as if as a practical i would encourage you guys to go away and think about the common what you would view as negative or destructive parts of yourself parts of yourself that you don't really want to show people think about what they may they're made up of in terms of emotions and behaviors that often come from those emotions and think about ones that you think would be beneficial to let go of manage or embrace and that's what i would give to you guys and how can we let go of some of those emotions and what about transmuting or how to transmute like you said, you gave the example of anger and using it as fuel for a martial art or some other physical endeavor. But how can we, is there a way to learn this ability of using, of controlling these emotions in your favor? Yes. So I'll give you a personal example. I like to use my anger to channel into my speaking and my writing. See, ang emotions, right, is energy. And energy can actually be transformed. It can't be destroyed nor created, right? It's just transformed. So I like to channel my anger into when I speak and when I write especially. And I usually turn that anger into, um, you know, motivation or energy, right? Some form of or adrenaline, right, maybe. So that's how I would transfer it personally. You know, if I'm speaking, I allow that anger to turn into passion about what I'm talking about. Because anger's, anger's a quite a neutral emotion, right? It's a powerful one, but it's neutral. You can be angry at literally anything, but then you can very easily find something else to be angry at. Like when you have an argument with a partner and then you end up taking it out on a glass in the kitchen and you smash it. You know, it's a transference of that. It's a re-manifestation of it. So... When you, when you think about it that way, you can transform it. So anger's a great one, and that's how you would do so. You transform it into something else. And picking up a creative endeavor is very good for things like anger and other powerful emotions that can very easily get out of hand. Because then you're matching, you're essentially bringing order to your chaos, right? And say, you know, it's, instead of feeling like you're boxing yourself in, you're already angry, so you don't want to be told by someone that you can't do something when you're already angry. That's not a good idea for anybody. <laughs> Instead, you want to give yourself an opportunity of freedom to explore something. You know, you want to create the perception of freedom through maybe journaling, writing, you know, whatever comes to mind. Even recording yourself, speaking, something like that, that you can channel it into. You know, and once you've brought order to it, this is where the integration process comes in. Right. This is where, for example, in dating, um, you have guys that are pushovers and they're not very good at conflict or setting their boundaries. But then over time, that builds a lot of resentment and resentment can turn into anger. 
So maybe they take it out on the internet or something and start saying derogatory things. Or alternatively, they learn how to conversate and debate and hold their own in a high social environment. And then what that does is it trains their ability, they channel that anger into objective and intellectual argument so that when they do enter their dating pool again, they feel more confident about setting their boundaries. You see what I mean there? There's two potentials there. So that that's another example or a few of how you can start to integrate these. You can transform them. Yeah, I, I love the idea of feelings or emotions. Yeah, more emotions than feelings, I guess. Mm -hmm. And being able to transform them, seeing them as a potential energy that you can transform into other forms of energy and being able to, ch to channel them into anything really and of course it's, I guess it's kind of like a muscle and the more you train the better you get at it yes. but at the same time just knowing that it's possible already is a life-changing concept you know? mm -hmm. knowing that you can use that anger or that resentment even or anything really and transform that feeling into something else yeah I think it's already a life-changing concept the thing is, the crazy part is, a lot of us have probably done it a few times throughout our life without even realizing, probably more commonly. Have you ever had an argument with a friend or some things made you angry? I'm using anger because that's one of the most common ones. Um, but you've been angry in the morning, right? And then you go to work and suddenly you find yourself you know, breezing through your work and just smashing through it completely, right? That's an example there. You find something to put into it because when you feel like you can't control your emotions, as we said, with things like public speaking or anything else, we find the need to control everything else. And inadvertently by doing so, we're actually channeling the emotion into it. Yeah. So a lot of us have been doing without realizing. And going back to the conquerors, do you think they were transmuting or channeling some feelings that came from maybe from their childhood or where do you think you were taking that energy from and trying to transform it into something like I'm going to be the emperor of the world now and conquer everyone because I'm so pissed off about something and where do you so, think that that kind of thing comes from? So that for those so there's something in sh you've got three states in shadow right you've got shadow dormant which means people who don't have a shadow at all, or no, they have a shadow, but they deny it. So those are people like empaths, you know, they're often the victims and the more vulnerable in the world. Um, then you have the shadow possessed. These are people like tyrants, conquerors, heavily violent people. Those are people that are governed by these emotions. So they've embraced everything, essentially, right? They haven't let go of certain things or just keeping things at bay they are governed by it all they've embraced the good and the bad everything and a good example of let's use a characterization in a movie so if any of you guys have seen the batman christopher nolan batmans specifically um i'll use an example from a character of each of those so let's take let's take rachel Right, Rachel is an example of somebody who I would say is shadow dormant with the tendency to be integrated. But she's mainly dormant. She's a very soft character and you know, very feminine, but she she probably wouldn't she wouldn't hurt her hair on anybody. You know, she seeks only the good side of things, generally speaking. Then you have Batman himself. He is shadow integrated. Right? You see he has violence and you know dark abilities but he uses them for good so you know he could easily kill somebody if he wanted to but he doesn't kill anybody even his enemies even bad people but he seeks justice he uses those darker parts of himself for good because he's integrated it you know he's learned what parts he needs to let go what he needs to manage and the parts of himself he needs to embrace then you have for example the joker who is possessed by it Right, he is, he's, not only is he shadow possessed, but he's also highly nihilistic, which is a terrible cocktail. You know, he just wants to see the world burn, as Alfred says in the film. You know, and those three dynamics there are all three 
of, of kind of what that looks like. So in this case, tyrants, most of them are possessed or integrated, but they choose to use those abilities for bad if they are integrated. But I'd say the majority of them are generally possessed unconsciously, massively so. You see this classic movie archetype where the innocent little boy when he's young goes through a hard time, abuse and his struggle, and then he grows up and he wants the world to feel like he felt when he was younger, so he just decides mm -hmm. to cause chaos, right? That's an example versus the person, that same little boy who grew up and now he doesn't want the world to experience what he felt because it was so painful. So now he seeks to help other people so they don't have to go what he went through, right? So that's the difference between Batman and Joker. And then you've got Rachel, like we said. They're the purely good people. And that's why, honestly, this is the age-old question answered for you. Why do the good people always go first? It's very simple. Power, in any sense, requires integration. True power. So the good people get the short end of the stick because they believe they can gain power from goodness alone from light alone and they cannot they cannot so they always try to but they never do generally speaking in terms of the traditional senses of power which is resource um, influence and the ability to create order and chaos so yeah that's a bit more of an overview really of, of characterizations that may explain that so do you think there are more Rachel's in the world than anything else yes yeah the integrated make the exceptions and then the possessed I'd say it goes in terms of integrated possessed and then dormant there's more dormant in the world right you've got a few people at the top who are both integrated and possessed who choose to use those abilities for control bad reasons nefarious reasons right but because the majority although we make up the powerful majority um, are good and are dormant they don't know how to come up against these guys because they haven't integrated the parts of themselves they end up just being victims yeah and do you think this has anything to do with the victim mentality as well or by being by having this shadow dormant and you want so much not to be seen as someone who's mean or evil you end up kind of acquiring a, a, a learned helplessness so you end up kind of becoming a victim because you're so used to this so I would actually say the victim mentality forms on both sides of the extremes both dormant and integrated but they manifest in different ways so you've got the victims for example who are victims through fear who dare not do anything as well and their own power is suppressed right and they, th those are the, the dormant people in the world. They just hide in their own little sort of shell. They don't come out. And then you have the possessed who are still victims, but they're saying, this happened to me. I'm a victim, so everybody else deserves to die. <laughs> There's still a victim mentality, but it's coming from a more violent and aggressive position. The integrated, do you have anyone that's shadow integrated, truly and manages that because it's not just a one day it happens and you set for the rest of your life you've got to keep that up um, but anyone that's integrated truly and has gone through an extensive process of that if you ask them do you see yourself as a victim they'll say no pretty much because part of integration is accepting that nobody's coming to save you first of all only you control your potential essentially and that you're only a victim if you allow yourself to be. That's the kind of underlying principle understanding that you have to adopt. Because to think about it, if you're going to adopt darker parts of yourself, most of that has come from trauma or you know, experience when you're younger, right? So if you're refusing to see yourself not as a victim, right? if you, if you see yourself as a victim, you're not going to want to go anywhere near that stuff. <laughs> So you have to get past that mentality to integrate. So it falls on both sides, I would say. Yeah, it manifests differently. Very interesting, man. And this topic is so fascinating. Well, to anyone wanting to delve into more of this, 
-hmm. All of these topics that we've mentioned really power, um, neural linguistic programming, how to reprogram our own minds and all of this. What are some references that you would give? Books or mm -hmm. food, uh, films or things to, that people should look for? So I would reference first a film and I, in terms of if you're interested in shadow integration and understanding that, definitely go and watch the Batman or Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy. So that's uh, Batman Begins, Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises. And study the key characters in there based on what you heard today from me say. You know, you could even make an avatar and an archetype, right, if you want, and to take notes of the different behaviours and their backstories. Excuse me. Um, in terms of human potential, I would actually reference a lot of the own work that myself and my partners do. We have infinite material on that, near infinite. You know, we have the Mind Gym app. It's called the Mind Gym. It's on the Apple Store and um, Google Play on Android. And it's basically the most powerful app in the world. A lot of the different areas through all the seven subjects that we discussed. Uh, there's audio visuals on there. And that really gives you a very holistic view of human potential as well. So if you're just interested in diving into this in a way that isn't biased or watered down and is raw and pure, then dive into that. And um, I'm sure we can link that somewhere as well on socials for anyone watching back. As yeah, well. of course, we'll leave a link for that, definitely. Cool. And, and anything, you, anything else you want to leave a link, we'll leave. And... Yeah, I would leave a specific book. Now, I don't personally read loads and loads of books because I've already learned quite a lot and I look for books that are kind of disruptive, things that are new, right? But if there were one book that I would recommend till this day, it would actually be, well, it's technically a book, but it's not an article. It would actually be diving into Carl Jung's complete um, papers, basically. But it's, it's his complete works, lectures, papers, uh, and, and all sorts, and art, um, articles, all made into one really large book. It's about a thousand plus pages, I believe. Um, but you can find that on Amazon as well. And if you want to look into a lot of at least the beginnings of the work that I do now, because a lot of my work and the work of my partners, we've built this discipline as an expansion of the work of people like Dr. Jung, you know, um, Freud and others in different fields, the same way as, you know, Carl Jung did with Freud. You know, he was his mentor, so he kind of evolved that. We've evolved a lot of that. If you want to get a foundational for it, dive into that book that's that's what i've referenced otherwise yeah that's anything else i see personally as noise <laughs> yeah i think this is a very important realization that people end up eventually hopefully will ensure that most things are noise and they won't actually help you hmm. so maybe reading a hundred books a year is not that good for you as you might think yeah. It's sometimes it's better to just read the same five or ten books over and over and really internalize their concepts. And, but, you know, you were talking about, first of all, the Batman trilogy is one of my absolute favorites. Yeah. Those, I wish every superhero movie used the Batman trilogy as a template because it was so good. Yeah. Like, everything about it. And Christian Bale also as Batman. Fantastic. Some still he fled her as the joker and well in general there were all every everything was phenomenal but i think that these three christian bale christopher nolan and he Ledger, yeah were absolutely amazing yeah and you know when you were talking about this in shadow integration and since we were talking about power a film that's talked about a lot when it comes to power and negotiation and that kind of thing. It's one of the all-time classics, The Godfather. Like, yes. What do you think of that trilogy as well? That is a really good example of, yeah, honestly, that's another one of my favorite trilogies. Yeah, it's up there. And that is another good series of films to look at. 
you know, you'll notice that a lot of, even in the mob, right, the, the mafia, they, they're bad people, but they still have principle. You know, they have the capacity to good, be good, they look after their own people. I'd still argue that a lot of them are, even in there, you can see they're adopting a victim mentality, you know, it's a, we came to this country, we were immigrants, we had nothing, and now we've got everything, and no one can take it from us, and we'll kill anyone that tries to. That kind of thing, it's still coming from a bit of a, a victim mentality, but, you know, there's, look at the individual characters massively. That's another good trilogy to study again people that are either on the spectrum you know the, the, the dormant the possessed and the center pieces the ideal integration yeah definitely and Don Corleone in the first movies as well first and second he is a brilliant example of being integrated he's by far nowhere near the most violent of characters in that but he's also highly respected because you see he treats people well if they treat him well you know even in the part where the war is being threatened between the families his focus is to try and prevent that because he sees initially at least he sees a bigger bigger potential for the family he doesn't want that he sees the, ne the negative effects that will happen and then you've got some of the younger siblings and the brothers who say they're more volatile you know they're possessed by some of that they're they're more violent, they want the war, they want to go, they find it almost fun, a game, a sporting good, you know, to go to that. So, again, brilliant, brilliant example to go into, massively, great trilogy. Yes, and, and I love the character arc they do with Michael, because Michael pretty much goes through all of the stages. He starts yes. kind of like the, the Rachel kind of character. A sweet Yo, guy. Of course, yeah, he was a sweetie. He, he was supposed to be the smart one, the one that went into politics or became a judge or something. But he ends up needing to come in and kind of save the family. And then he, he has all of the stages. There are times in which he's integrated. There are times in which he's a maniac. So I think paying attention to both Vito and Michael Corleone, it's very interesting to see all of those stages and how yes. you can use them in your favor. Yeah, again, because you can oscillate. When you get to that point of integration, there'll be periods of life based on experience and um, both positive and negative that will pull you back to one extreme or the other. So it's about maintaining that, you know, and it's being able to know that if this was a simple term, I could leave you with it would be knowing that you have the ability for violence but also peace and knowing when to exercise both with a good moral compass yeah yes better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the war exactly exactly yeah man and you know I think people get triggered very easily nowadays is there any way that we can um, disarm those triggers so that we stop being triggered by them? You remove the fear. You remove people's fear. That's why people are triggered, generally, because they're shown something that speaks to something within them. And it's the fact that it's inside of them and they hear it, that's what scares them. Because they've been raised to think it's bad or that it's dangerous or that it's wrong. So instead, facing that and exploring that they project that out onto the world again and they bounce it back so in this case in terms of you know yeah i would say begin by removing the fear and how do you remove the fear you remove the judgment of self that's yeah that's where it begins so i guess the shadow integration is one of the key things that we can do because we will need to remove the judgment while we're doing it and then naturally we will remove most of the fear hopefully at least yeah yeah that's it it's because all fear comes from uh, you know this is it's is that's why we deceive ourselves and we deceive other people the only reason why people lie and deceive fundamentally is for fear of something and that's why we lie to ourselves because we fear parts of ourselves so when you remove fear you become a very honest person it's deep, man. It's deep. Yeah. That's how I like it. So, we, we've already kind of talked about this in the beginning, but 
in other terms, what would you tell your 18 years, 18 year old self today? If you could talk to him, have a five minute pep talk, what would you tell him? I tell him, believe that you can be more than what you are and that life isn't as serious as you make it. Yeah. I think that would release so much. Yep. I have to remind myself even now, some days, of that. Yeah, But do you think it's because it's in your nature that, and then that's why we need to be constantly reminding us ourselves of that kind of thing? Yes, yeah, it's, well, we live in a busy world, a noisy world, and the more noisy the world is, the less we look inwards, because there's more output. There's more ways to escape facing those darker parts of ourselves, but it's also highly stressful because of the noise. And it, when there's more input, the human brain, when it's overloaded, instantly puts it on a scale of priority. So for example, this is based on purely quantity, not even intrinsic importance, which is why, for example, if you have a hundred thousand dollars in one bank account and a million in another bank account the millions just fund money that you've won from the lottery but the hundred thousand dollars is something that you've um, worked ten years to save up for even if you lose the hundred thousand dollars right you're going to be less bothered about it than you are by the million just by the quantity right mm -hmm. because even though you've done more to get to that point it's the number and the brain perceives it as importance just by scale so that is to say that you know really it's by trying to create an environment of a less noisy world I would say you know trying to spend a bit more time in peace and question the emotions that you have by asking them why why am I feeling this why am I thinking this and you'll get to the bottom of it you know kind of sporadic ideas there admittedly but yeah <laughs> no, I think it makes sense. I think starting with questioning your feelings, many times we, we are not even, like, we are interpreting the signals in the wrong way. And many times we're just a bit hungry or underslept or so, it's something else. It's not that you're actually mad at someone, it's just that it's something in your body that's triggering you and so you're easily triggered because of that and then anything that happens it's easier to trigger you yeah. and about the other thing you said I think yeah that's one of the important things about being in a flow state because yes. then you're completely focused on doing whatever you're doing and you won't let that noise affect you you're just there present conscious doing whatever you need to do mm -hmm. yeah absolutely again the order and chaos thing that's been the common theme throughout all of this that balance between both of the forces of order and chaos and that's the same with your emotions absolutely yeah i think we ended up with this theme because of your hat so we kind of yeah. had this conditioning in our minds <laughs> absolutely we did set the tone at the beginning so it's <laughs> and it's that and also that you can never even escape from it right everything is a kind of a product of that an extension of it so one way or another it's almost tied to one of them isn't it or the other yeah interesting no totally totally so alex you know there, there's a question that i always ask when we're coming to the tail end with you i think it might be even more interesting because kind of it's your life's work so I usually ask people, what's their definition of success? And because you already work with people that by all means are considered successful by other people, but maybe sometimes they don't consider themselves successful because they always want more, they always want to be striving. With all of that experience and knowledge, what's your definition of success? My definition of success would be by learning how to as I mentioned before, wield both order and chaos to live in flow with the way of life itself because everything else will be a product of that. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh yeah, doing one little bit every single day or doing work every day is going to lead you to success. You know, some days you're just going to want to feel like doing nothing and that's absolutely okay. You know, 
Um, but overall, if you can learn through flow state, right, through transferring that from your mind into your life and everything else, right, living that way of life in harmony with the forces of existence itself, that is success. Because you're living in your natural state of being and you'll notice life gets infinitely easier. You'll manifest far more and quicker and bigger because you're not fighting against yourself. So every other definition of success, and this is not me saying mine's the best, but objectively, every other definition of success out there is a product of doing this one thing, is living in flow with it all. That's it, so integrating, integrating order and chaos and living and breathing that, that is my view of success. Um, becoming Batman should be our, yeah. our goal, ultimately. I'm right. Alex, thank you so much for coming. Are there any last considerations, last thoughts you would like to leave the audience with? And if you want to, to plug anything else, talk about your X account or Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why not? So uh, where you can find me on Instagram is at AP The Mentalist on Instagram. You can also find me on YouTube at The Mentalist. And you can find me on X. Stuff it. Here's a bit of a reveal. If you know who I am on X, then you know who I am now in person. You'll find me on X as the Gentleman's Guild. And uh, you can find... Well, yeah, that's that. And in terms of anybody as a, I suppose, call to action, just to throw one in there, a lot of you guys watching this are probably going to be inspiring entrepreneurs, maybe well-established. If a lot of what we've talked about, or even a small part of what we've talked about in today's session, has resonated with you, sounds like you, and sounds like something that you seek to transcend or evolve from or into, get in touch with me on any of the channels I've just listed, um, because this is absolutely the work that I do, and I've got plenty of time for people like yourself. We're the leaders, we are the pioneers, and we've got to set the example for the others behind us. So. It's been a pleasure, Gabriel. Thank you for having me on this podcast. It's been wonderful, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, the pleasure is mine, Alex. Thank you so much for coming.